CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th, Part 6, coming to you live from Death Curse Society. Look forward to talking to you, seeing you, and being cool. Again, ladies and gentlemen, with another edition of Monday Maniacs from Death Curse Society. I'm Red Crank. I got the Colonel and Zigzag. What is going on, guys? Not much. Not much. Oh, sorry. Man. Playing, playing oh, with man. the pussy already, huh? Pussy already. No, no, no. She's going to be just saying no. It is her and her adoption date. She is really officially one year. But happy adoption date, Elvira. And uh, she is in the mood. So. It is National Cat Day. Wow. Too. So, yeah. Really? I saw that earlier. There you go. Well, there How you appropriate. Go. Well, pretty happy. But I want to give her props for sticking up with my fucking ass for a year. And many more to come. Fair enough. <laughs> Ziggy, how about you? How are you doing today? Fucking tops, baby. Been waiting <laughs> on this one for a while. And, uh, yeah, man. I'm excited. Hope you are, too. Uh, we're going to get into it in a little bit with a very special guest. That's right. Can't wait. Cannot wait. I, I have to admit, I told Ziggy right, right before we came on air, uh, this one has me a little nervous. Just slightly. Just slightly. You fucking asshole. Once you said that and we went to black and everything, I started going, fuck, here we go. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm all right, though. I'm all right. I'm all right. All right. All right. <sighs> Let's get down to business. Uh, thanks to our members, our final girls and guys. You can find out how to be a member on our website at deathcursesociety.com. But thanks to our final girls and guys, Chris, Lorena, Christy, Patricia, Tanya, and Tyrone, our crazy Ralph Raymond, and our camp counselors, S. Michael, Stacy Lynn, Orlando, and Dave. That's right. Thank the you blood. Thanks very much. And don't forget, next week we will be covering our review of Cocaine Bear. But tonight, man, if you guys have not gotten enough of that sexy promo <laughs> I've been going I've been going with for the last month and a half. I love that damn thing. Uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have with us in the studio the writer, director of, well, co writer, director of One Dark Night, the director of Sometimes They Come Back from Stephen King, and of course, the writer, director of Friday the 13th, Part 6, Jason Libs, Mr. Tommy McLaughlin. Wow. Tom, how are you, sir? How are you, boys? Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. I love your opening. I know. Manic Monday, it was like, I've always loved that song. I've always wanted to do that in a band. I didn't think anybody had ever done it. And then I go, wow. And and the images and stuff are just so cool. I I love that. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, we found found that cover from a band over in England, uh, Shrimp Field, Uh a couple years ago. And it was right, it coincided right around the time we were starting this branch of our show. And I reached out to them and said, "Hey, do you mind? Do you guys mind if we use this?" And they're like, "No, use show our name and tell them who we are, and that's all we ask." I'm like, that's "Excellent." Great. So, yes. 
Hopefully uh, yeah. somebody will pick it up and use it and they get some, some money. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. Right. Oh, yeah. We all do this stuff for free because we love it. And, it, you know, at a certain point you go, you're doing this for free. And it's like, yeah, because we love it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. Story of our totally lives. Get it, man. Totally Sto- get it. Story of this show. We're doing this for free, basically. So, <laughs> yeah. but we love this. So, yeah. um, we especially love the moments that we have to, you know, kind of get into it with our guests like you. I mean, um, we've chatted with quite a few different people, mostly independent filmmakers and uh, even fan film filmmakers. We'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But um, I want to start with you on, can you tell us about your childhood a little bit and what it was like growing up and what drew you to filmmaking? Were you a, a mischievous kid or were you a good student? Uh, I know you were probably sneaking off to make home movies with your friends. I heard uh, a couple of stories about that. Yeah. So start, let's start with that. I don't think I'm pleasing the colonel here. He's taking me very seriously. Oh, that's, yeah. that's yeah. just his look. I'm trying to that's keep my excitement contained, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's one of those wrestler looks. You know, just before the guy goes ape shit on somebody. It's just no, no, no. Well, I make a joke all the time. I have the male version of RBF. It's nothing personal. It's just the way I look. So we're all good. I'm just playing with you. Um, <laughs> childhood. Okay. Uh, let me try to do the Cliff Notes version of this because uh, there is a book that Joe Madre, oh shit, it's his birthday today. I've got to write it. Let's remember that. Um, anyway, Joe Madre did this book called uh, Strange Idea of Entertainment. Yes. You know, based on my line in the movie. And there's so many stories and stuff in there. He really kind of covered so much. And so if you at all a fan of the movies and the progression of how things happen and stuff. He did a great job with that. But basically, um, my father was a fire eater, a magician, um, and he went to USC film school, graduated in 1949, tried to make it as a filmmaker, but they were like, kid, no, no, no. Of course, kid, he was almost 40 because uh, <laughs> it was after the war. And, uh, you know, he finally got like a, you know, a, I guess his GI loan or something so he could come out to USC. And, you know, that was obviously way before anybody had been successful coming out of there. Um, So he went around with his 16 millimeter camera, tried to see if he could get some work. He ended up kind of doing news footage and stuff because everything was, you know, on film in those days. Um, And, you know, he finally said, "Ah, I got to get a regular job. Went and worked at a paint store, met my mother. I guess I came along pretty fast because I got married pretty soon <laughs> and he moved to Culver City and Culver City in those days was where the Hal Roach studios were, you mm. know, MGM and they have all the big back lots and things that they used to have. And so it was like, for me, a dream because he, you know, he taught me magic. He taught me, you know, show business stuff. And of course, a great love of the movies. And the reason the James Bond tribute, uh, is in the, my Friday the 13th, the opening, because that to me was like the big moment when my father finally took me to the movies was to see Dr. No. So that, you know, had a huge impact on me. And then, of course, I, I stayed with the Bond franchise. Probably I started to burn out around Roger Moore because I was such a Sean Connery kind of guy. Mm. But not that he didn't do a great job. And certainly Daniel Craig has done, like, really kind of reinvented him, and I think in a very cool way. I don't know what's going to be next. So I started making little eight millimeter movies in the back lots of MGM on the weekends. We wow. could either crawl under one fence or crawl over. And I got my friends and we did horror movies. We did comedies, you know, anything that had a set because it looked like, you know, we were on a movie lot and with all the, all the trimmings. Of course, we couldn't act, you know, and <laughs> knew nothing about what we were doing film wise. So some of it came out, some of it never came back from the lab in Chicago where it had to be <laughs> But, you know, the passion was there, the wanting to make movies. Um, and at the same time, you know, as I was heading later in my life towards, you know, the 60s, then the Beatles hit and the mm. Rolling Stones and all the British bands. And that was it. It's like, where are the girls going? They're the guys with the long hair. Okay. And so, <laughs> bang, you know, there you go. Changed. I got thrown out of eight high schools in Los Angeles over this. And the hair was like just touching my ears. But that's all it took. You know, you're going to cut that? Nope. Why? Because I'm in a band. I don't care. You're supposed to be in high school. <laughs> I know. I'm in both. No, you're not. You're not here anymore. Why? And oh, it, it was it was strange. Um, 
but you know, rock and roll was my thing all through, you know, like 64 till 69. Um, and then everything got really screwed up. Uh, Charles Manson you know, um. murdered. He was the hippie killer, you know, um, Altmont, the Stones, and the, obviously the Hells Angels, you know, beating the shit out of that guy. And Hendrix died. Mama Cass died. Uh, uh, John, uh, Jim Morrison died. Keith mm. Moon died. I mean, it's like all these people are going, holy shit, you know. And some of the guys in my band was beginning to get serious with the drugs. I was like, you know, hold it. I don't like when a doctor puts a needle in. I'm not going to do it myself. You know, <laughs> sorry, right. guys. So, you know, I bailed and I wanted to do something different as a lead singer. And I don't know what possessed me to do this. Nobody knows. I don't know. I decided I wanted to learn how to be a mind performer because I thought on stage, that's something Mick Jagger wasn't doing or, you know, uh, I mean, you know, James Brown, any of the other guys that are, are, were such great showmen, but Roger Daltrey. So I went over there, didn't speak French, left my girlfriend, left the band, off all that, and kind of committed to the starving artist in Paris for a year. But it was a great turning point and became sort of like where I really kind of got into, you know, creating things artistically, but, you know, in a physical way as a performer. Because it wasn't dance, but it had elements of it. Mm -hmm. But I thought, saw I could do comedy and maybe merge it with movies. So I created a production company called Cinemine. And <laughs> Cinemine, which I still have to this day, is kind of a throwback to what um, uh, E.W. Griffith said uh, when the silence were in their heyday, is that, you know, finally, we have a universal language. Finally, we can talk to anybody, any age, any, you know, anywhere, and they understand. Because there was a pride in having very few uh, title cards. You know, the better movies had very few title cards because they really wanted to act it out and show you. And I just thought that great because so many of the movies I loved always opened with like five minutes without sound or without music or anything. Right. It was all action or whatever. And then comedies, the same thing. It's like you tell the story through the vision. So that kind of put me on to that road where I was kind of combining those two elements. Um, came back to the United States, had no money, got on a street corner with a hat down. And that was kind of the beginning of making money from what I, you know, was beginning to finally grasp was when me, this is going to be my road. Very nice. Very nice. Um, before I get to the next question, I want to throw this link out there in the comments. This is a, uh, a link to Amazon where you can pick up the book he was just talking about, Strange Idea of Entertainment, Conversations with Tom McLaughlin. Uh, nice. So hopefully we'll get a few more sales for your, your buddy there. and. Help him out. I'm, I need to go and pick up a copy of this. Right. Book. There'll be at least one. At least one. Today. Yeah. Maybe two. <laughs> so. he, did, he did a great job. And I, I really bugged him about, I want a lot of pictures. I'm one of those guys that brings us in, sticks it on the back of the toilet. And it's like, I don't want to read. I want to just look at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so, a I guess a lot, nice. a lot of photos. That's fine. Well, I'm uh, kind of the same way, too. The bigger print of the book I'm reading, the better. <laughs> <laughs> if I can knock it out in two days, I'm good. You need to, I'm sorry. Yeah, you need to stick with the novellas, the little <laughs> short ones. Yeah. Uh, so your father was a filmmaking student uh, as well as a magician. And uh, what kind of a relationship did you have with your, with your parents? And how did they form you into such the great storyteller that you are today? And was there ever a moment that your father expressed his pride in seeing you accomplish maybe what he couldn't much much later down the line yeah because wow. i mean in my childhood days when i was you know just don't get caught when you go over there you know and <laughs> so he Hello. loved that you know? Back fail. and his his whole thing was like you know don't you want to do magic and it's like no you don't you know what you don't want to do that you make movies you know that that's something you should do but once rock and roll hit he, he and my mother were about to disown me. <laughs> he could not understand that. Um, he, he went through a period where he was getting very drunk at night and coming home, and I was the target. You know? mm -hmm. And so the combination of not wanting to go home, escape into rock and roll, go to school, get the hell out, you know, had a you know blonde, beautiful girlfriend, moved out at 15 to the Hollywood Hills and sort of began, you know, that fantasy life. Wow. Um, but then... But, you know, everything came around when I started making movies, the first one, One Dark Night. And he even had um, 
he like emptied the pool and did one dark night on the bottom of the pool in that same lettering. And when we were doing um, Friday the 13th, I needed some pool where we could grind up Jason's neck. And I right. said to my dad, no, they won't let us do it at USC. Um, obviously, we couldn't see anything in the real lake if we tried to do it. You know, we tried, yes, of course, yeah, you know. So <laughs> he was, you know, he was out there with his little tiny instamatic camera taking pictures. He was in hog heaven. And at a point when I had movies, you know, what, like, I was doing like two or three a year, you know, he would say like, oh, did you see our review? Look at this. And he didn't realize he said R, you know, <laughs> and I love that. I just thought that was amazing. I finally like rebonded, you know, in the very thing that kind of started, you know, our wow. relationship about art. My mother was the one that gave me a lot of affection. You know, she sort of mm -hmm. taught me about love and things. And then uh, the weird thing that really had, that really kind of threw me for a loop was when I was 11, my mother had a mental breakdown. And, you know, to know, as you guys can imagine, to know your mother is one kind of person. And then suddenly she's this whole other person with a whole other reality and things. And at 11, you know, you, you're trying to figure out what, what it, did something I did with it, you know, and of course, yeah. you know, it wasn't, right. but it, threw me into that world of the surreal. And when I'd go and visit her at, uh, uh, what's the name of the Metropolitan, in a Metropolitan Hospital, mm -hmm. same one that Marilyn Monroe was in a few years before um, in Norwalk. And you would go in and, you know, it wasn't quite like, you know, the remake, or not the remake, but the, the recent Halloween where, you know, you see all these people out, you know, some chain, whatever, wasn't that far, but they did have a big open space where there was people that were wandering in their own world. And, you know, one of them came up to me and he said, you know, how are you young man? I am William Shakespeare. Have you read anything of mine? Um, <laughs> with, you know, I mean, it was like adults acting strange and very, very believable. So it had a lot to do too with that influence of, when you're in that other world or when you're an actor and you're that character, you're not you, you're this, you just have to totally believe it, you know, right. and think and talk and act like this is who you are, period. And it also gives me a great love of actors to put themselves out that emotionally, you know, in some of these roles. It, it's incredible. I, I don't know if you've seen uh, uh, what's the name of it, Tar. Um, not yet. I want to, though. It's a fucking freaky part that she plays from this arrogant, intelligent, put people down in the, you know, it's like I wanted to have a dictionary to keep looking up the words that she was using because you knew they were genuine, but amazing. And then to watch this evolution of what occurs with that character, but it's mm -hmm. it's her, you know, Kate Blanchett, it's just amazing in that movie. So all that stuff really kind of gave me this great love and appreciation of people that are a little off, you know, in life, um, or just, you know, are downs and, you know, you, you, people step away, I gravitate because it's like, I want to know how you're perceiving things in the best way I can know. And same thing with anybody of any culture or any ethnicity. I just love the, the differences that, that we all have. And I am my problems, you know, in the beginning of the movies, you know, that you starting with one dark night, they didn't want me to put a black girl in there. And it was like, why? It's like, well, I think, you know, you know, and sorry, you know, and Gabriel <laughs> Union, Gabriel Union is now a very big, you know, uh, black mm. star. They, they wouldn't let me make her the sorority, the head of the sorority in this uh, Steven Spielberg series that I was doing called The Others. And I mean, I've got into such a battle, you know, with me in NBC. And I thought, how do you know about every sorority across America? Who says somebody hasn't? And Gabriel was very hurt. And, you know, I said, I could give you this other part. I, don't, I can't force it. You know, I get it. I get it. I get it. So, I mean, things like that were always something where, you know, it's like, can't we look at each other? It's like we're all the same. Is it got to be this, this prejudices about things and old, old knowledge of. We still can't. We still can't. It, in some cases, know. you know, I know. so I mean, that's a shame. <laughs> I mean, we've we've come so far, but have we? Eh, yeah. We got a lot. We got a lot further to go. So. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't realize you were old enough to have met William Shakespeare, but that's that's good. That's <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, I actually did. Um, <laughs> he, he act, I, actually, he's rooming here now upstairs, or at least that's what he says he is. He's, mm. he's, here. Yeah. he's not here sometimes, but then then the nights I see him walking the halls, trying to think. So you want any ideas? Well, no. Okay. 
The, the exclamations are coming from inside the abode. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, Colonel, would you like to ask a, a question of Mr. McLaughlin? Uh, I kind of do, but I guess we're going, since we're in this path here. Um, if we're going down the surreal too, path. I don't want to take too much firepower away from Ziggy because he is a huge fan of One Dark Knight. Uh, as am I. So, but my biggest question for One Dark Knight, trying to time up your age and everything, man, how was it? What was it like working with Adam West? Like, I really hope this is a cool story you have because well, it's Batman. Like, it's Batman. <laughs> so, well, I think it's become clear. I haven't used the word, but Rebel. There's an mm -hmm. awful lot of Rebel in me, and from the hair thing to be allowed to go through all that stuff, you know. Um, you know, it was obviously one part of it. And the same thing when everybody was doing slashers, I wanted to go throw back to the old, you know, hammer horror movies and things, the Gothic. And yeah. when we were looking at, you know, people that were coming in, and I, of course, was looking for the gorgeous blonde and stuff. Nate Kelly came in and it's like, she looks, she looks, is she Asian? Yeah, well, I think partly, you know, and she had braces on, her hair was all on her face, you know, almost like a goth girl. But she kicked back her hair and began to perform. I went, shit, we got to have her. You know? mm. um, Adam's name came up, but the casting person said, well, they submitted Adam West, but I, he's probably going to be like everybody else, not wanting because he's Batman. I went, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Is he an actor? Oh, yeah, of course. I want him. I, that, to me, to be able to do a movie and have you know, Adam West in it would be super cool. So he was great on the set. He was funny storyteller so warm so great but when i'd say action um you say wait, wait a minute tom before we go can you, i was thinking about doing this line and starting up like this and then get the little you know the little word here so my voice would keep going down and up i went that sounds like batman yes that's what i used i said mm, no <laughs> no <laughs> just talk like the way we're talking right now oh okay so if nobody ever picked him up on that, maybe that's why they had issues. But sure as shit, you know, shot the movie. After we finished, somebody took over the production company. They came in, kicked me, the editor, everybody away from the movie. They cut their version, brought Adam in and the woman that played his wife, uh, uh, Carol, not Carol, oh, just blanking on her name. Uh, I'll think of it in a second. Um, and they revoiced them. So there's sections of the movie where you still hear, you know, Olivia, we are not going to do that, are you? You know, and it's like, <laughs> oh, shit. But yeah, it's, he just really felt comfortable like that. But if you do a character long, long enough, like the shit, you know, Austin Butler's going through, he still sounds that's, like Elvis. I that's what I was getting it. ready to bring up. <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's an Orange County kid, you know, come on. Right. You know, it's like, but it could be, I, I don't hear it, but for a lot of people, you know, two years of playing that, you know, Elvis and doing that voice and stuff, it's a hard thing to kind of take out of you, you know, especially if all you're doing is promoting the movie on top yes. of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if he, if he ventures any, you know, anywhere down in the Southern United States, somebody will slap that accent out of him pretty easily. <laughs> I'm sure. But um, yeah, to answer your question, girl, that's, he was great. He was wonderful and warm and nothing affected me more emotionally than when he passed away and city hall downtown here had, you know, the bat light up yeah. there. And I was like, I mean, you know, you just, you know, you came out and stood on the roof so you could see it, you know, it was just mm -hmm. so cool that they did that, you know, for him. Uh, Want to hit a couple of comments here real quick. Yeah. Patricia says, hello, Tommy. She'll be seeing you soon in Pittsburgh. Um, if you will, yes. At the, what is that? Horror Realm Con, is that correct? Yes, Horror Realm. Yeah, so... uh and you I don't do many that. cons. You don't get around the circuit too much on the cons, eh? Well, you know, it's weird. Um, yeah, it, I mean, as many years as I've been in horror, I mean, if James Whale, you know, did obviously Frankenstein, God Frankenstein, or any of those guys who did the, you know, the werewolf, I'd be there in a millisecond. How, how much? Mm -hmm. $100? Sure. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'd do anything. And mind. now we're still kind of in that. Oh, you're in the movie? Oh, yeah, you're in. The, you know, it's like if you're not in the movie, what do you do? Well, I wrote it and directed it. Ah, oh, uh, that's great. And the bookers <laughs> are like that too. It's like, why should we do that? When I go, it's it's a wonderful reception. People are so grateful and stuff. But I say, well, you just don't do these. I go, 
I've been wanting to do, been trying to do them for like 10 years. Wow. And, and so I had about, I don't know, four years or so before the pandemic. And then, you know, that stopped everything. And then even before the pandemic ended, I went to um, Atlanta, you know, mm. for, for one of them. Um, and uh, it was a Day of the Dead. Yeah, Days of the Days Dead. Of the Dead. Yep. Um, so, you know, and I guess they just really want to keep kind of going towards the people that always draw, like C.J. Graham. I know, or Tom Matthews and stuff, and I think the all, I think almost all of us that are available are going to be at the one in Pittsburgh, which is great. You know, it looks like a pretty good like, reunion of, of that crew. Mm-hmm. So we've never stopped being close friends out all these years, even though everybody's like in a different place in the world. It's like you know, Facebooks, Instagrams, you mm-hmm. know, little texts, jokes, calls. You want to do this? You know. And it's it's amazing. So when we get together at the cons. It's just like a family reunion. You know, you know everybody, and it's it's wonderful. But that movie was like that. It was just yeah. one big, you know, bunch of people in their late twenties going, yeah, nobody's <laughs> nobody's minding us. We're, you know, we're down in Georgia. You know, let's have fun and make this thing fun. So right. it, it just the vibe stayed. Well, back to the uh, one dark one dark night trend that we were on for a minute. Lorena says One Dark Night is in her top 10 favorite movies. Easy. Wow. And, well, yeah. I understand this. Yes. <laughs> and S. Michael says, as a big dungeon, D&D nerd, when I saw One Dark Night in the 80s, I wondered if you were inspired by the lich in Dungeons & Dragons for Raymer, who is essentially a wizard psychic who sacrifices his own life for greater power. Is there any connection? No, I can't say there is. I, you know, I, I wasn't aware of that at all. Um, what Raymar was for me is John Barrymore in Svengali. If mm. any of you guys have ever seen Svengali, wow. you know, with the, mm-hmm. the beard and the stringy hair and stuff, yeah. and the eyes, you know, and that obviously he's got this power. And we were, we, I mean, all of my friends and stuff, we were really into, you know, all the, uh, I guess you'd call them, you know, uh, occult, uh, supernatural, psychic, psychic, psychical sciences and stuff. So we would join these groups and figure out, you know, how to lower our brain waves to a certain level, like the alpha. And we could take something and go, you know, start reading stuff. And, and it felt like you were just making it up. Mm-hmm. And you open your eyes and the person's going, that this is by my grandfather, that's his watch. Uh, you know, but we could spin toothpicks in water and change the reverse, the, reverse the direction. All of us can do this. That's the thing that's so amazing because this, these courses were recruiting everything, truck drivers, moms, you know, wannabe actors, whatever. It was a huge you know, swath of different people. And everybody has this gift. But the weird thing is, after you do it, it's like a parlor trick. It's like, OK, <laughs> what am I going to do with it? You know, and you and you leave it. But we use so little of our brain. You know, there's all these areas, I, and of course, the great meditators in the world and the people that really spend years in a cave, you know, can do a lot of stuff, including, you know, levitation. Right. Um, so it, it's, it's just amazing. So I wanted to put some of that in there. Plus, the mausoleum was off of the uh, catacombs when I was in Paris. I went down to the catacombs. What the mm-hmm. hell is the matter with you? People go missing and forever when they go into those things. I know. And I was one of those suckers that went, because what you got in those days, they don't do it anymore, was just a candle. And you're with a group, you know, and everybody would, you know, go along. And I went, oh, fuck it. I went down another corridor. Oh now, we're talking, these corridors were about, I don't know, arm's length on both sides. Skulls. Yeah. Bones yeah. And skulls for miles and miles. And, and so when I got to a certain point, I went. I don't know if this is such a good idea. I didn't leave breadcrumbs or anything. <laughs> so I start to try to find my way back and I stop for a moment. And then there's that the only Uh-oh. time this has ever happened in my life, that feeling that everybody talks about the hair sticking up in the back of your neck. Right. Where it's like, okay, what am I scared of? There's nothing here. Nobody's here with a knife. Nobody's going to hurt me. But I had just had that, you know, supernatural fear. And of course that hit me very hard. And I said, I got to somehow do something that has that, you know, element to it. And, you know, the mausoleum is kind of where I went. And when we were shooting, Meg Telly was just so attuned to things that she would hear noises no one else was hearing. You know, what just happened there? Nothing, Meg. He was like, oh, I heard some bagging on that marble. No, 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 no. 
and she would run. I mean, when the scenes would have finished, she got, I thought, you know, it was amazing. She's just one of those people that just kind of pulled in the vibes. And I thought, well, that's kind of what I was feeling in the catacombs. So yeah, it, it did, it was a combination of those two things. And then years later, if any of you guys go back and look at the movie again, look close at Raymar's face. You know, mm -hmm. they, they took uh, a life cast from a completely unknown actor at that time, figuring this guy's not going anywhere. You know, we can take his face. He's going to know, you know, one way or the other. Anybody know what that actor? I know this. Holy shit. Hold on a second. Uh, I can tell you that this movie is going to need some more cowbell. That's it. That's King it. of cowbells. Yes, sir. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. I, mean, it's like, I never knew that all these years. The, the, the makeup people never told me that's whose face that is. And then yeah. when you look, you go, oh, son of a bitch. Yeah. Well, now, now if you do this One Dark Knight remake, you got to cast him. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to talk about that a little bit later. Get in there, Ziggy. I'm not. I, I, I've been patient. You know, know. we're talking one dark night. I, I, you're killing me, man. I, I saw this thing in theaters. I saw the initial theater release. It was a double feature, and I can't even remember what it was with. It was either Evil Dead or uh, Mausoleum or something like that. Could have been Mausoleum. That was actually the title when we wrote the script. Really? It's called Mausoleum, and then they got out first. So I was like, shit. So yeah. then we <laughs> shot it in the title, Rest in Peace. Yes. And then somebody else changed One Dark to One Dark Night. I hated both my cause and I both hated that title because it sounded like a kid's book, you know, One Dark Night, you know, but or as the years gone on, this, I guess the innocence of that, you know, combined with the, the grossness by the time you get to the end of it, sort of like, okay, you know, it sounded like it was pretty uh, tame. And in the beginning of the movie, it's fairly tame, you know, a couple of things to indicate something's going to happen. And it's not till like the last 25 minutes does it finally get, you know, pedal to the metal. That is, so, and that's but, it. And I was pissed that we got a PG. Because there wasn't PG-13 in those days. You know, right, you know, right. PG, you know. And I, you know, I wanted, you know, I wanted people to say, oh, we're going to see something we shouldn't be seeing. But the flip side of that was when the kids would say, um, you know, I'm going to go see a movie this weekend. Went, One Dark Night. Wait, well, what is that? PG. PG. Oh, okay. So it should it. be fine. Go, grandma took them. Yep. Mom and dad went and got to a certain point. It's like, okay, we're up. You know. <laughs> and what has happened over the years is people have come up to me and went, you know how many days I stayed under my bed for that damn movie of yours? It freaked me out. I was like seven, you know, and you're that. And all of that, there was a filmmaker or big producer that said I became a movie maker because that fascinated me because it scared me so much I wanted to do that one day. And so I mean things like that. I thought, okay, well I guess the PG in the long run kind of worked out you know, in that regard. Um, we walked where, into I really, it. where I really thought, okay, well the times there are changing, sir, is I was at a horror festival uh with the movie and Sam Raimi was there with this little movie called Evil Dead. <laughs> I arrived in, in Paris, I guess, the, 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 this day and that night they were showing Evil Dead. And mine was going to show the next night. So you come into the, the place and this French horror crowd was like nothing I ever imagined you could do in the theater and get away with it. Um, they, you know, the balconies had people throwing firecrackers off, you know, and they'd oh, go geez. off just as they were coming down before they hit the row below. They were, I mean, I, I can't tell you how much shit was being thrown. And it, it just felt like, okay, this is the crowd that were there for the guillotine, you know, but it's not all fear. So, I mean, it, and then they started to, you know, chant in French, blood, 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 blood. It was absolutely wild. Wow. And I'm thinking, I ain't got nothing like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to die a hundred deaths. Out there. And Sam got up, you know, on the stage. They went nuts. I mean, I'm surprised they didn't build a statue of him, you know, for the park. I mean, it was like he was the king, and I went, all right, that's the new horror. I mean, the comedy, the fast-paced stuff that he was doing, and uh, Sam, all those guys, they were like a bunch of kids, you know. When when yeah. Sam introduced the movie, he said, "I'm so excited, I want to do a somersault," and he did, you know, and stood. <laughs> but I love Sam. I mean, he just he's he's never stopped being a child. Um, I visit him on Spider-Man and things. He's just nice, nicest guy. So 
he's one of those people that truly deserved all that success, you know, that he got. And yeah. ended up, we did okay with the reaction, but it was obviously very, no, it was chant blood because they weren't going to get a drop. Um, <laughs> but when we got to the ending, then they got quite excited, you know, about the whole thing. So I thought, okay, great. So I get up, you know, and, you know, the night before, of course, the masses just, you know, mob Sam. You know, I get up and people are kind of walking by. A few people stop and stuff, and, you know. And then as I looked in the lobby, they're all around Sam. You know, <laughs> come to see the movie. And I went, all right, so much for celebrity. You know, maybe my best right. shot. But I didn't, you know, all the movies I saw growing up, you know, in, in the, obviously, the uh, universal classic horror movies and all of those things in the 50s and 60s, the British films and stuff, no shit went on till towards the end. You get a right. couple little teases, but... A lot of talk, 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 because I'm looking at him now going, how did I sit still at 10 for all this? You know, but that's, that's how you made him cheap, too. You know, fill up a lot of, you know, time with conversations about stuff. But there are certain ones like Bride of Frankenstein that was so entertaining that every moment, you know, James Whale was a genius, you know, at, at knowing how to keep people's eyes on the screen and not their cell phones. Well, I mean, um, just the whole... Just the setup with the girls fucking with, you know, Julie the whole time, you know, and, and what they're going to do to her and stuff. And nobody knows what's really coming at them, you know. And yeah. for me, the moments like with the soundtrack, too. I mean, did you have anything involved with the soundtrack for One Dark Night? Like that synthetic? Nothing, huh? No, that was all like post after, after me. We, the only thing I, I saw when they cut it together, it was like it has no ending. There's nothing, mm. you know, that, that happens. You just saw Meg and uh, and uh, Olivia, and I guess he was holding up uh, Dave Matthews, uh, Dave no, Matthews, and walking away. And then the credits started. And I went, what the fuck? So <laughs> I went to the guy and I said, look, I want to give you an ending. Everybody's doing jump scares at the end. I mean, that's, that's what, you know, even Friday the 13th, obviously, you know, had to do that. Um, because Carrie, you know, just delivered. Mm. And to be in that theater for Carrie, you know, when people mm. had no idea this was coming, nobody ever saw it. I'm telling you, boys, I mean, they went, Wah! I mean, <laughs> like two feet off the ground. <laughs> the whole fucking audience. I mean, same thing seeing Halloween for the first weekend, on the first weekend with this crowd. Popcorn, you know, people, <laughs> you know, flying. I mean, it was, it was just incredible. And so, you know, everybody wanted a piece of that, you know, big jump scare at the ending. So, I, you know, the only thing I could come up with is like, all right, wait a minute, what happened to Carol and Kitty? You know, they're, they've got to be someplace, right? We tell them to disappear. So I got, the, you know, my art director built a piece of the set in my backyard and, you know, the mausoleum wall. We got all the bodies back. We put, we got the actual uh, Leslie Spates, you know, her hand, you know, <laughs> kind of reaching towards the toothbrush. So I thought, okay, that should get a laugh. And then at the corpse's head, oh. you know, drop in with a, ah! You know, right. And of course, it boosted up the ending, and it was like cheap. And but at least I felt like, all right, you know, if, if you want to ride, you got to have one last boot on the roller coaster. Um, some people now hate that kind of stuff. Other people still love it. You know, if it's if it's done right and unexpected, it's wonderful. I fucking loved it because it just zooms right to that toothbrush, and you're like, yep. And you're like, and, and what was with the toothbrush, man? I mean, that was just is that I, one of my good friends uh, who was actually in my comedy group. His girlfriend walked around with a yellow toothbrush all the time, you know. And I said, "Can I ask you something?" Very pretty girl, by the way. I said, "Why, why do you do that?" She goes, I "Love the way it tastes." In the mood. <laughs> <laughs> Oral fixation of some sort, but yeah. um, that's that's where that came from because I I'm always looking for something quirky that I've seen. It's like, oh, we got to have this person do this, or they got to carry this, or well, you know, whatever. It- it t- completely disarms you because you're like, oh yeah, there's that. That was weird seeing that toothbrush. Holy shit! You know, all of a sudden that <laughs> thing falls down, and yeah, that's, that was the best. But um, what I wanted to get into like the corpses in One Dark Night. Uh, well, I'm gonna uh, Tom. Ber- Tom Berman. Berman, that's it. Yeah. Uh, was it the plan the whole time to use no actors, static props that were just hollow and 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 believe this added to the lifelessness of them so much and raise the terror to levels that I wasn't used to at that point. 
when those girls are hugging, when they find each other, Kitty, you know, and uh, and they embrace, they're like, we got to get out of here. And then they think they're safe. And then you get that shot of the hallway and you just kind of see it, just a shadow, a, a, an outline. That is the shit that made my hair stand up. That is what got me that catacomb feeling right there. That was it. I mean, and, uh, I, but I was always fascinated by what was the story behind those, those making them that way, you know, and, and to do that, was there ever, a uh, a choice or, or maybe to bring some real actors in the makeup for the corpses. No, from the very beginning, I thought, okay, George Romero did it mm. as good as you can do it. I still feel that. I love that the original so much. And there have been some great visions of different ways of going with all that, but just the black and white and the funkiness and looking just like your neighbors, you know, <laughs> doing that and chewing on things and stuff. And I thought, okay, Raymar's got power to levitate or levitate things or throw things because his room is filled with all that. Yeah. What if these crypts open up and the coffins come down and they come up and they don't walk? They just are under his power, you know, to move like, you know, like dolls, except they're kind of broken and different weights and sizes. And of course, I put the pus on there because I thought, yeah. you know, that pushing against her skin yes. or the foot going into the corpse yes. and all the maggots kind of coming out. You know, all unreal stuff, but it's that funhouse approach to the thing. You know, they really can't hurt you, but they can certainly scare you by coming, you know, down the hall or pushing up against you. And that's what um, he wanted, I, their fear. He wanted their fear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that fear. And then uh, when we talked about making them, Tom said, I wouldn't tell anybody, but those are all real skeletons. Oh, like, shit. Bullshit. He goes, no, that's when we get them. So, <laughs> And when I mentioned that a couple of times to the girls, you know, I need to say something. It's like, you shouldn't be. No, I'm not shitting me. <laughs> so it's kind of worked, you know, for us. Um, but the funny thing, the funniest image, God, I wish I could have gotten a picture of this. Is we have a freeway out here, the 405, which is, mm -hmm. you know, the big get from uh, the valley to Los Angeles through and out to Santa Monica. And at five in the, in the evening, you know, going into that whole rush hour period, it is bumper to bumper to bumper. And when I did that little piece for the ending of One Dark Night and I did it at my house, mm -hmm. I had all those corpses with me for the shots. So I borrowed my dad's station wagon and piled them all into the back of it. And we're heading back to the valley where Tom's place was. And I got a flat tire on the 405. <laughs> all the stuff for the flat tire was you know, in the, in the back of the station wagon. Under so out come all the bodies on the side of the road. <laughs> I wish you could have seen the faces, you know, because I mean, it's like, they, especially in those days, you know, being like 81, I guess that was, you know, you didn't see something like that. It wasn't like, oh, that's Hollywood. It's like, holy shit, what is, you know? So that was, that was one wonderful little perk, you know, for doing that. Those courses were, are rowdy too. And that you was the other thing. A, you were put on a watch list right then and there, it sounds <laughs> right. like. I mean, but you had all bases covered to get the audience. Even when that first coffin comes down and the door swings open, they're hit with that, that stink. They react to the stink of it, you know, and I'm just yeah. like, I'm in there with them, man. It's like, it, it just gets me every time, even now, all these yeah. years later. Yeah, uh, if, you've, if you've ever smelt a dead body, it, you never forget it. It's, it's a very, very pungent, you know, like, it's like thick in your face. Yeah. The smell, it's, it's so, you know, I think anytime we do any of that kind of stuff to me, like when he opens up the thing, it's kind of you know, just horrible, horrible, you know. And I was the only one when I did a series uh, called Leaving L.A. about the L.A. coroner's office that we went to research it. We went down to the coroner's office. You know, they had the cold crypt where all the mm -hmm. bodies that had been there forever, you know, the John Doe's and Jane Doe's and all that. And they go, you want to take a look in there? And all the producers like, mm -mm, no thanks. And, I'm, I'm, <laughs> and I went. And I can't believe how many skin colors happen, depending how long you've been in there. I mean, purples mm -hmm. and yellows and greens and stuff. But mm -hmm. what sort of like stopped me was the children, you know, to see like a rack of just different age children. I went, okay, I'm done. You yeah. Know, yeah. I go. yeah. But yeah, it was, it was freaky. Yeah. Well. Uh, I know we talked about Kitty's character a little bit. S. Michael wants to know in One Dark Night, when Kitty's foot squishes into the maggoty corpse, was it just as traumatic for the actress as it appeared to be for the character? Were those real maggots? And that he wanted to say that is we never used real years. maggots. It's, it's earthworms. 
you know, uh. and on screen, I mean, you know what they're supposed to be and they look creepy enough, you know, you buy it. But in all these movies where you see, it looks like, you know, maggots, they, you know, <laughs> they don't go that way. And Maybe she, somebody has at this point, you know, some indie filmmaker, you know, where are you? It's real maggots and you're going to put them in your mouth. Fuck you. No, 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 thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. No, no, that was like a story from uh, Fulci, City of the Living Dead with the maggots. And yeah. then Christopher George actually slipped some into his pipe yeah. pouch and he got, you know, smoked some maggots and was upset about it. I do remember. Well, that I think about that. mealworms and those things. Is, you know, it's like, no, we don't have enough. Yeah, give, give me, you know, and you just pick them up and start to sprinkle them around, you know, like the top <laughs> and the crust and the pie. Mm. <laughs> I will say her reaction to when her foot goes in there, she she got it. she sold that man because she yeah. kicked it up a couple octaves with that scream, you know. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah, I'm believing this. She's she's tripping, man, right now. She was great. And the night we went in the cemetery where they jump over the wall and they're walking through, and they're supposed to be stoned. She went and got stoned. <laughs> if I knew that, I I don't know what I would have said. But you know, she said, well, I really wanted to be like the character, stoned and in a cemetery. <laughs> I said, well, it worked. Great acting. What can I say? Yeah. But yeah, she really threw herself into the part. She was great. You know, I kind of lost touch with her. I don't know. You know, when they marry, the last names change, and it's so hard to find them. Yeah. Well, we've been hearing about it for about a decade now about yes. you wanting to revisit and possibly remake One Dark Night. Uh, what's the status of that project, and what would that look like forty plus years after the original? You know, it's like I went like you know balls out on it probably like maybe three years ago or so. Um, and I had sketches made and what it is, is it's not a remake as much as it's a reimagining. Yes. Okay. Because I felt after all this time, Raymar is such, you know, a fascinating character. And for a lot of people, they love the fact that you didn't, you know, there's no real backstory. You're just like, boom, you're in here and this guy and he's in the, you know, in the crypts and then he comes out, but he doesn't do anything other than the power and that mystery but i kept thinking you know the whole backstory i had for him you know was fascinating for me um and that you know he's this this older magician because that's the only job he could do that you know he he, he had like a, a, a the doc started character the guy with the white hair and stuff. yes he was like his assistant and took care of him and he was the one that would get him the girls and keep him going because they were making you know good money um, and all the magicians could not figure out how he could levitate people the way he did. Because, you know, like doing a scene like at the Magic Castle, you know, and it's, they're going, this guy is the greatest. I, I can't believe it. And meanwhile, you know, you see these moments of how, you know, he gets on these girls in places and, and does this, you know, fragile old man, you know, would you walk me to the car number? You know, so there's a whole, the first act is all setting him up and setting up his daughter, Olivia, who's there and, you know, what she's trying to do. And Olivia actually is going to be a junior high school teacher. And her four students, you know, four students are the three bully girls and Meg, uh, the Meg character. But I'm taking their ages, you know, down to junior high. Kids are meaner, nastier, yeah. that whole thing. But then there's this sort of, you know, innocence about you know, they're, they're kids, basically, you know, just barely getting into their teens. So, you know, all that dynamic I wanted to change. Um, so one, you really felt for um, Meg's character because she's just a little slow, just, you know, and that's why she's always seeing Olivia, you know, because she gets picked on or she doesn't know mm -hmm. the word or whatever, but you love her and so does Olivia. So when she finds out what these girls have done, I mean, she's, you know, really, fire it up uh, to get in there, even though just earlier that day, she had to attend her father's funeral in that mm. same place. And I try to make the story sort of come together a little bit more, you know, and they're piecing it together. But, you know, to me, the corpses are still gonna float. They're gonna float better because we got better technology. So the wires, you know, most of those things are all shot, you know, when you see the feet and then you see the heads move. Yeah. And a couple of the wire shots, like the one you mentioned about, you know, coming out of the dark. Yeah. And into the, I mean, yeah, that was wire, but you know, it looked so great, and I think you can see it even with the, you know, nowadays with the, you know, the, uh, the HD, you know, mm. because so many movies get spoiled. It's like you yeah. know, you see the, the, the lion, cowardly lions, 
hair, wig, you know, right? <laughs> I mean, you got to go in and paint all that stuff out. It didn't matter in film, you know, but this digital stuff pulls everything out. Mm. Well, after One Dark Night, you jumped into Friday the 13th, Part 6. And uh, mm. side note, uh, yesterday was the 36th anniversary of Jason Libs being released on home video. Oh, I really? That was an, I thought that was yeah. an interesting little trivia piece for tonight. What, um, what year? 36. The 36th anniversary came out uh, 87 uh, wow. on home video. So that's amazing. Or, I guess VHS, you know. So anyway, that, how, how are you approaching One Dark Night? It is okay. sitting there. I got derailed because for 30, I don't know, 33, 34 years, I've been asked this question Are you ever going to do a Friday the 13th again? I'd mm -hmm. love to see if you, you know. And I said, I'll tell you exactly what I told. Frank Mancuso after the movie opened and they were all so thrilled how well it's being uh, received by the people who did come because part five really hurt you know the franchise. <laughs> and I don't know, if I was a horror fan at that time and I saw part four, which I thought was great, and then I went and saw part five and it's like, that's not even Jason. Oh, dude, wait a minute, Tommy's gonna be Jason? Oh, fuck this. <laughs> You know, and that's what a lot of people thought. So instead of two years, they went, we're going to put the next one out one year. We mm -hmm. can't, you know, lose our, our audience. So when I met with him, you know, I said, you know, I don't really do these kinds of things. I've been offered so many and I just, you know, it's just hard for me to come up with something besides what they really want to see, which is slashing up women. And, and, and he said, well, look, bring him back from the dead. That's all. I said, Nothing else? No. The rest of it, up to you. And wow. they literally, I mean, if you hate the film, anything in it, talk to me. <laughs> if you love it, <laughs> talk to me. You know, I mean, he really allowed me incredible freedom. The only thing he made me take out was Jason's father. For the same reason was that if the movie ends and if somebody's going, this next one would be about him and his dad? Oh, fuck, no. It's like, no, <laughs> don't give him any reason to get upset. You say, Jason is back. There he is. In comes Alice Cooper, you know, he's back. And that's what we wanted to sell. But partly, a lot of people didn't want to come back. But secondly, if I had just seen Aliens 2, Jim Cameron's Aliens 2, and the next weekend was Friday the 13th, or I could bring all my buds to go see Aliens 2 and watch them react to it, guess where you go? So that really made us number two instead of number one right. and that, that that's of course in the, in the money terms of you know we didn't know number one it's like dude if you would have waited a couple yes. of weeks so put it out you know because it, it does have that spillover but if the movie really delivers mm -hmm. and it you, did I, I mean part six if you look at the majority of lists across the nation the world of the, the real horror fans like that it's always six it's always four at the top of the list one or yeah, two always. yeah always and it, it amazes me, yeah. Yeah. Um, so after all that time, not coming up with anything other than, you know, teaching Chong meet Jason, which mm -hmm. I still think would have been fun. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> but Frank went, no, no, not the same audience. I said, are you kidding me? They drink <laughs> exactly the same beer, the same audience. smoke the yeah. same weed. They're, you know, <laughs> they're going to laugh and they're going to get scared. They're going to love it. No, nah, I think the horror movie people, I said, the horror movie people love it. No, no. And they, they had, you know, that franchise, but he was trying to get Freddy. And New Line wasn't going to, you know. And if they said, mm -hmm. would you do Freddy and Jason? I'm like, Frank is time to the wolf, man, huh? Yeah, we're, we're to that point. Okay, let me think about it. But then wow. you know, it didn't never happen. You, oh, but you, finally, won't do Frankenstein, you won't do Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, but you won't do, uh, or you would do Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, but you won't do Frankenstein meets Abbott and Costello. Yeah. So, in those I, days, you know, I guess. It, it, I, I think, again, people really felt, well, this is that audience and this is, things have changed. I mean, boys, you think about, mm -hmm. you know, Walking Dead, number one yeah. in the country, when we yeah. had to see it at midnight and we were like right. the unwashed, you know, the mud people coming in to see corpses <laughs> and shit. And now everybody wants to see dead people eating on other people. It was amazing. I mean, the whole society has changed so much, you know, in those regards. So it's like now, you know, I'm going to see, like I always do, me and my girlfriend every fucking Friday night, whatever just opened, you know, be there in that first Yahoo crowd, you know, and those are the people that 
I've been waiting for six months. I've been waiting for two years, I've been, <laughs> you know, and I don't care what it is. It's like, you know, either it's the next it or it's obviously, you know, we're going to be there for Scream. Mm. I'm sort of burnt out on it, but I'm going to go anyway, you know, because I want to see how people Guilty. are responding. And <laughs> it's been incredible with Smile and Barbarians and um, uh, X and, yes. and what's her face? Uh, Mia Goth. Mia Goth. Mia, yeah, Mia Goth. Mm. In the, you know, and I went, everybody's pleased. It's low budget. It's independent, you know, filmmakers. Two of those guys, that was like their first film. I thought, okay, we're kind of back to those 70s and 80s period where they were giving, you know, studios were giving these guys shots. Well, well, uh, Smile well, was, oh, I was yeah. just going to say Smile was done by Parker Finn, which was a former student where you teach, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they had a screening there. And, you know, he was actually my son, Shane, who's a assistant director, uh, AD, mm. and he, he was in the same classes because he was uh, studying screenplay writing as well. And nice. Parker, yeah, he just, for like 11 years, you know, he did the walk, walk around, meet people, write some stuff, going selling dead shit jobs, I want to do this and stuff, until he decided, you know, I'm going to make a short, I'm just going to do it, make it the one the way I want to do it, put it out there, and shot it at Dodge, at the college I teach at, and COVID, and the festival, doors closed, and I was yeah. like, fuck. So... You know, it found its way onto the internet, obviously. Paramount happened to see it. I think you probably know the story of the Paramount Plus mm -hmm. thing and put it in front of an audience and seeing it with all these, you know, college filmmakers who can sit there and be pretty critical, you know, about yeah. the kid that's now hit a home run. They were going nuts. I mean, people whose legs were jumping. I was bruised on the side by the girl next to me. And her <laughs> leg was like, boom, you know, and I thought, great, you know, jump scares are still working. This is wonderful. So, and he's a sweet guy, really nice guy. So it's always, always great when that happens. Yeah. What were you going to ask, Colonel? No, no it's more, it's more going to add on to what Tommy was saying about you know, it kind of, kind of, kind of does feel like a re, the second golden era, era of horror now because it is so popular. And I was going to say Terrifier too, extremely low budget independent film, just blew up. I mean, when the when I went to go see it in the theater, I would say yeah. probably sixty percent of the theater. Had no clue what it was. They were just going by word of mouth. Yep. And it was just, just fun watching them react to it because, you know, I'm, I'm a little desensitized yep. to this stuff. So it's like, okay, but you know, the, the group of teenagers next to me freaking out. Yeah. I enjoyed that just as much as the movie. <laughs> and watching them react. It's proving again that this stuff is still a viable, you know what I mean? It's something that can yeah. be done. You know, they, the violent, brutal brutality still sells still does and it, that's the proof with the terrifier stuff in my opinion so yeah it, it's it's one of two things and we used to deal with this all the time um you know because i started like taking my material around trying to get jobs in the 70s and it literally was if if i went in and pitched one dark night like i did many times uh it's like it, it, you know it's not bad not bad but i'm looking for something with like you know set in a forest or some feel something some it's like no people around kind of thing and you got these girls and they're camping you know that's friday 13th okay not camping i don't know what they're doing or some sorority or something i don't know uh, but you know and just you know and get a guy i don't care what he's wearing but his face has got to be covered and stuff and you know you watch him you know one after the other die and i said what's the story why you want a story i went yeah my story <laughs> so but that was sort of what if you wanted a job they could you know come up with money for that and mm -hmm. it was great money for the producers because you could sell all the stuff overseas, you know, with these incredible mm -hmm. covers. I'm sure you guys have seen the covers of oh, yeah. DVDs and DHSs oh, yeah. in those days. I mean, they just kicked our ass with stuff. They're going, okay, I want to not only like look at this, I want to like put it on my desk. You know, this is such great art. I just saw actually just yesterday, a French fan of mine sent me One Dark Night has finally been released over there. Ah. It's not even DHS. And you should see the cover. But one dark, it is the coolest fucking thing, just the graphics of it and stuff. And I went, wow, now all these years later, now it comes out and it's got the best cover of all of them. <laughs> That's nice. something that needs to change. It needs to be more merch for One Dark Night out there. I'd like to see a Raymar action figure. I, I need uh, the soundtrack on vinyl. I mean, I need all this shit, man. Yeah, I, I would love it. You know, we don't make a cent. None of us, you know, 
a company went bankrupt. Nothing comes in, nothing for the actors. You know, just wow. two, you know hmm. same thing with my Friday. It's like, you know, I wasn't in the DGA. So there's like, you know, there's no residuals, none of that kind of stuff. Oh, wow. The actors what? at least, you know, getting paid. So that's good. But again, like I said at the beginning of our conversation, you do it for love. You do yeah. it because we want to see how people react. You want to be, you know, the person yeah. who's just slowing down at the accident. You know, any blood? Mm, you know, so I mean, it's there's always that, you know, curiosity. You know, it's seeing something that you think you might not be able to unsee. You know, mm -hmm. and that threat of something like that. But the ones to me again that really work is when I find myself engaged with the characters in the situation. I mean. Obviously, Carrie, and those performances, you know, uh, with Sissy and, and uh, Piper Laurie, yeah. I mean, you know, it's just amazing stuff. And you were there. I mean, Exorcist, you were there for those people, you know, that little girl. And just when they do that right, you know, you really, you care. And now you kind of don't want anything to happen. You know, it's, something's going to happen because that's what the movie is. But it, it's, I just hated going to, you know, the theaters where it's like, kill the bitch! Yeah, rabbit tits. Yeah, you know it's like okay. You know, I'm in the wrong house here. This is the this is the wrong side of town for me. Yeah, but um, you know, one of the it's, it's, that's a whole different you know. Go to the strip bars, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, one of the after effects of uh, Jason Lives and Friday the Thirteenth in general was uh, here over the last five or six years or so. We've had this rise of fan films since yeah. the property was tied up in in the lawsuit um can you tell us a little bit about your involvement in vengeance and then vengeance Two bloodlines and speaking of peter anthony popped in the room to say hello uh, he says look at this fucking guy miss you sir see you in pennsylvania uh you know peter is one well, of the I producers you, of, of vengeance yeah so um <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about vengeance and and bloodlines how you got involved and what you thought of those oh, productions? No, but I can tell you that Peter posted him with this blonde on his knee. That I didn't was see like, that. I, I want to look like him. I'm going back to the gym, <laughs> shaving my head. You know, that's the kind of women you get. But he gets. I, I never had anything like that. So I was, I was jealous this morning of Peter's. Oh, yeah. the, ma the mad Cuban was showing off, I think, this morning. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, nice tits. Her too. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> The, 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 all those guys are so great. I mean, these, I can't tell you how much fun it was doing it. And when I was first, you know, called about it, um, it it's like, well, we were going to do a script that's kind of based on like your Friday and we want to have Jason's father in it. And, you know, you have a problem, you know, are you going to use that at some point? And I said, I guess not <laughs> yeah. anymore with the way, you know, we're in this long lawsuit and all this stuff. So yeah, that, you know, with my blessings to do a good job. And he said, well, you know, we're going to get CJ to play the father. I went, are you kidding me? That is fucking brilliant. That is mm -hmm. great. And then they said, if you would like, I'd love you to come up and like be the caretaker in the opening scene. And I go, I'm in. Give me wow. a plane ticket. Yeah. So just a chance to act, you know, opposite CJ was incredible mm -hmm. thrill. And that first one, I mean, they were, they were just flying on energy and ideas. You know, it's like, oh, let's do it over here. Okay, let's do it. You know, and I thought, I don't know if this is going to cut together. They're just, you know, but they're having such a ball. And I loved, I just love the concept that there's a period in film where you didn't get the movies that you wanted. So it's like, fuck it. We're going to make it. We'll figure out how to make them, why we're making them. And we'll get the fans to give us the money. And as long as we spend it on the films and then give it to charity, whatever is left over, why not? We're not making money. You know, nobody can go back and say, you know, you'll owe us this or that. So it's like right. this whole incredible period of cinema where the fans are making the movies that they want to see. And, and, and they all get their names on it at the end. So I just love that. I just think it's great. Some of them are absolute ass just kicking pieces. Others are like, well, kind of know what you're getting. <laughs> you know? yeah, and they're right. trying. And, you know, I, I saw somebody doing uh, one in England. And they're doing basically Jason Lives, except with English accents, playing all the yeah. characters and not really, you know, talented actors. And it just was fun. You know, it's just great to see them, you know, basically <laughs> kind of note for note. And to me, it was like, oh, I kind of wrote a play and now somebody's going to take it on another <laughs> stage and do it. But, so all that stuff, I, I think, is great. So then when that did so well, 
um, and they were doing vengeance too. Then he, you know, uh, Jason Brooks said, you know, we're going to write you a bigger part. And I go, okay, you're going to kill me? I don't know yet. Don't kill me. <laughs> you know, if this goes well, I want to come back for the third one. Um, you know, story of the, the Walt story. But again, it was that same, just go up there, you know, have a ball with everybody. Uh, CJ just really kicked my ass in that one scene, you know, because I told him, <laughs> look, I'm going to, I see you, I'm going to run. You better catch me, you know, because I'll be out that other door. And boy, he did. He grabbed me. And I was airborne. <laughs> Bam, you know, he goes, you all right? I go, part of the job, you know, I shouldn't look all right. But yeah, we had a, we had a great time doing it. And I saw the first preview that they showed up in Seattle and the crowd was going crazy. Just absolutely yeah. loved it. So it's, it's wonderful to see it's, you know, really, really working. And it'd be interesting to see if there's going to be more now that, you know, the lawsuit has been settled and Crystal Lake is happening. That's, that's another wound in me that I don't know if I want to even go into. Uh, but it's... Um, I was going to ask about that later. Yeah, we'll it's just the way it is. You know, the, the, power, the power gets to, gets the gigs. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm still this kind of indie guy going, yeah, that was the guy who did that. Yeah, okay. But I'm not done, you know, with, with my uh, quest. Like I said earlier, I'm a rebel. And if they go, right. you, know, <laughs> you know, you're not, well, not going mean, to be able to do this. And you go watch this. So... I'm still in the watch. Watch this space. Yeah. Know. And that's the thing. Love, love is. You say love it. It's for the love and everything. That's all great. But when you've already started to prove your track record, I think you know what I mean. You should probably be considered in any time the words Friday the Thirteenth and new movie come up, and it's known you have a script that's already out there. It's finished a couple of years ago. Jason never dies. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that something you? Is that we're still. That's the one we'd be pushing. Yeah, I I can't tell you yes. some of the stuff. I unfortunately because it's not at that stage yet. But you know, having spent a year and a half on the diary of Pamela Voorhees, mm. which you know people go, we don't want to see the back. I said, you want to see this. I agree. This <laughs> is really different, and this is you know Pamela. You watch this as she turns more and more into you know from being a sociopath to a psychopath. And then her son watching all this, being part of this, and her defending him because people treat him like a freak. And when you think about, you know, this is all happening like late 40s, early 50s, you know, it's like put him in an institution. He needs to be, you know, and here's mom, you know, fucked up for got a whole bunch of stuff that happens to her and along the way. And, you know, to me, it's like making a female serial killer in the middle of America after the war and we were all worrying about the a-bomb and we're building bomb shelters and communism was coming that's all you saw on tv the red scare mm -hmm. everybody was in a state of fear so she just kind of went you know under the radar uh in terms of yeah yeah i never somebody got killed in that town and stuff and so we built up to me you know what would be a you know really great and we were thinking netflix so the thing could, you know, story could go on and on. We had it as a film, and then we thought, this is so much bigger to get to that point when they get the Crystal Lake. So a lot of work, a lot of story concept, uh, illustrations and things that we did for it, some really cool stuff. And then <laughs> Halloween morning, you know, yeah. look at the computer, it's like, oh, fuck me. You know, it's like <laughs> over. And yeah, like I a, had talked to Cindy Miller trying to get him to listen to me. And he, I can't hear it, Tom. I can't hear it. I can't hear it. You know. <laughs> and I mean, I was pushing. I'm calling him at home, which you don't do in show business. You do not call anybody at home. But I didn't know any other way. He knows me. We met, you know, quite a long time ago. I knew there was no way with Sean, but you know what, you know, where this whole world was. But I thought mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. I could get the victor. But I had no idea that they were going down that that path. And that's why he couldn't talk to me. You know, it's like, yeah. and then when I talked to, um, What's the showrunner of uh, Hannibal? Um, Brian Fuller. Yeah, Brian. Same thing. I said, Brian, I got a lot of great things if you want to, you know, read them. And, and, no, I can't. I, I, it's got to be my thing. I don't want to be influenced. Mm. So I went, okay, I get it. Fuck, I, man. So, yeah. but I have another idea for that. So All it's right. not, I'm not going to throw anything away. I'm just going to see if I can make it better on some other level. And Try to recycle it. Life. That's all you can do. If, you know, they give you a, Lemons, lemonade. There we lemonade. go. 
Oh. And you were you were working with uh, the writer director of Jason Rising on the Diary, uh, James yes. Sweet, correct? Yeah, James Sweet, well, wonderful guy. We every Saturday morning for months and months and months, you know, we had to stop talking about horror movies. Can we get back to the script? You know, oh yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've got like over here like fifty index cards of all the scenes and stuff as we were putting oh. this thing together. Uh, Walter Figueroa is a, a storyboard artist that I was, you know, using, and I was driving him crazy. Nope, redo it. Nope, you gotta fix, fix that. Nope, it's gotta look like, because my goal was is that taking Walter's sketches, put them into the script. So when you flip the page, it's like, holy shit, is that what I'm about to read? You know, or mm. what you just read, you flip it and there it is. And yeah. so that, that it would just, again, visually, because we were doing some, you know, some really cool stuff. And I'm not just saying that because we came up with it. It's like, when I was writing these things, and the same thing with, with Jason Lives, I needed to keep putting myself in the theater, staring at the screen going, do I hear everybody around going, fuck yeah, you know, <laughs> they weren't doing that, write something else, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, to me, it's that audience participation that made those things so great, and people don't react that way anymore, but mm -hmm. they're starting to, which is great, mm -hmm. you know, people are now kind of getting into the thrill of people talking at the screen, you know, it's not like, shut up, you know, it's like they're laughing. Right. And that's what I tried to do with, one, as you know, both One Dark Night and mm -hmm. uh, Jason Lives is to give the audience the punchline. You know, Nancy dies, the credit card don't, goes, and there's all this. Don't leave home, home without it. You yeah, get yeah. a big laugh from everybody. I'm going to get laid tonight for that, don't I? You know, <laughs> you set up, you know, to do that for me. I mean, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it was great because the audience, you know, in the movie were like one, one event, one experience. See, all this is going to do. If this Crystal Lake show shows up and it sucks, I, I, I'm just going to be more pissed at now hearing these stories. You know what I'm saying? This is ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I'm probably not supposed to be saying this, but, you know, it's like I don't have any secrets. I'm not going to rip them off you know, any right. more so than I think they rip me off or any of that kind of stuff. I just I just don't go that direction. I think, you know, you, you're fortunate. You get some wild idea, and if you pull it off and it's mm -hmm. the right place, right time, I mean, I hope it succeeds for all the people that, you know, yes. are involved that, that care about it. And I loved uh, Bates Motel, which I didn't mm -hmm. think I was. I like didn't that. either. Yeah. And I didn't either. Amazing. Holy shit. But again, go back. And those actors, those those characters, it just was amazing. You know, oh, and the, and, the writing, too. Good yeah. God. Well, I didn't think it'd be possible to enhance those movies in any way. And they absolutely did with that show. I mean, yeah. Yeah. When I, f I felt they did pretty, I felt Brian Fuller did well with Hannibal too. I yeah, thought that exactly. was just an amazing well, piece they, of television. So that's where you have that hope, you know, that yeah. he's going to come in and he's got some really cool ideas. You know, I heard a little tiny bit about it in terms of his influences that kind of brought him to this, but he's a horror geek like us. Mm -hmm. You know, he shows up at those screenings and all the rest of that stuff. And I love that. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, one of us, one of us. Yeah. You know, if they're going to the conventions, it's that same thing, you know, and people go, look at there. There's your Jason right there, yeah. you know, and wait, wait, see him on the back, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's like, you know, you're going to have that on when you're in your, you know, coffin. Yeah, I'm really proud of it too. Okay. But, well, he is saying all the right things about it at this point. So, yeah. We'll, 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 the jury is out until we see it. We'll see. We'll see. What I don't understand is, you know, the whole thing was okay, Sean gets the mask and anything of Jason that's with the mask and, and, um, What's his face? Victor. Uh, Walter, uh, Walter, uh, thinking, like, sorry, uh, Miller, Victor Miller. He's going to get the mom, little Jason, I guess Crystal Lake, mm -hmm. and Adrian King's character. Uh, Alice. Uh, Alice, yeah. Alice. And that's basically it. But Fuller's out there saying, nope, we're going into the first movie, we're going to second, or like, maybe we go to outer space. <laughs> you know, I, I think... I think it has something to do with its being released on television rather than on film. I don't know if that distribution rights have anything different to do with. That's what I've been hearing. So, you know, well, I could see that, except in this day and age, everything is, you know, streamed and sent out mm. and they're mm. shooting everything on the same formats and stuff. It's not like, you know, one's but, actually on film and the other's just shooting on videotape. But whatever contracts were written in 1980, 1979, 
don't necessarily translate to that language yeah, in 2022 or 2023, maybe. So think of that. That's yeah. that's the stories I've been hearing right, from some legal minds. So I mean, no one's really uh, yeah, in I our can, circle anyway has I looked at that in. settlement. Yeah, I've been dug in deep on this thing for like the last three years. Trust me, because yeah. this is like, all right, I think I got something I would love to contribute and, you know, and please the fans and say, mm -hmm. you know, yep, he ain't over. He's got another one in him for this. So I was just reaching out to anybody, everybody, studio people. And, you know, from the moment that I finished that script and my lawyer was taking it to Warner's and uh, New Line, they were like, nope. Can't look at it. No, you know, this thing's probably gonna never happen. You know, I don't even know where we are with the rights and all the rest of that. So, you know, my lawyer handed it back and said, they won't look at it. And, you know, and I couldn't go to Blumhouse. I couldn't go to any of the other places, you know. It's like, we'd love to do it. We'd love to do it Friday. But right now, we don't know where this is gonna go. So mm -hmm. when it became this sort of clear, all right, this is this, this is this. And when we were, you know, doing Diary of uh, Pamela Voorhees, you know, we were committed to Victor is the one that's going to love this. Victor is the one that wanted this series to be more character driven. And mm -hmm. he never liked the hockey mask. Sean never liked the hockey mask. I mean, you know, took the money. Everybody took the money. But, <laughs> you know, it's like I said, you know, I think he's going to really love this. But had I known that he was doing this, I would have went, OK, fine. Well, you know, James, we're doing something else. Yeah. Yeah, I think of yeah. something else to write about. But the fact that he said, I just can't listen to it, you know, we went, all right, let's keep going. So and you it, never... uh, it happens, you know, those things happen yeah. all the time. You know, I, yeah. when I wrote Gate with an Angel, there was no E.T., there was no Splash, there was no Mannequin, there was none of that. It's like a fantasy creature and a guy fall in love, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, no. And so, I mean, I don't know how many years it took. And then, of course, Splash, when that happened, it was like, uh, okay. <laughs> But that and then everybody obviously opened the door, in. and then all yep. these other things came. E.T., you know, obviously way before that, you know, Boy and His Dog movie, except Boy and His Alien movie. And, I, you know, I love that genre. You know, when it works, it's great. But, of course, mm -hmm. when my movie came out, you know, I have to rip off a splash. You know, what do you say, Gene? I say it's two thumbs down. You know. So, <laughs> you know, that, that, that was hard. But, you know, yeah. it's like... It, it, you don't know when you're going to come out. If you, when I was doing TV movies, if something great was on CBS and you had something on ABC and wherever the audience went, even two points, if they won, we were losers. Anyway, just, well, yesterday you thought this was the greatest movie you ever saw. Yeah, but it didn't do the numbers. It was just off by this much. Yeah, it, you know, it, that's this <laughs> business, you know. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it, man. I'd be handing out middle fingers all day to these people right in their face. I, I wouldn't be able to stop. <laughs> I, I, I frustration. I wouldn't be able to handle the shit, man. Yeah, knowing well, you know, what I know about you, just in what you've delivered thus far. I mean, it, it's it's enough right. for me, you know. You think it'll be about the work at the mm. end of the day, but it it really isn't. And because we of the, you know, who embrace the creative minds and these cool ideas and get behind them. I mean, I get behind films i know nothing about them but it's like you got to see this this is great you know and we're one club and then there's all these people that make money by doing everything they can not to get fired so for the last 10 years since i've been teaching film at, at, at dodge college at chapman um the first thing i start out with every class on the blackboard i write no i say see this you are going to hear that word more than any other word in your life. I'm telling you, why is that? Anybody? Because they get to keep their job. Because most scripts, movies, whatever you come in with, if they go, mm, I don't no, I don't think so. And if they go, well, let me think about it, whatever. And they jot down the notes and they say to their boss, would you be interested with it? No. <laughs> if he pushed it, if he said, I really think it's good. Oh, yeah? Where are you working next week? Or, God forbid, they make the movie and it tanks. Whatever happened to that guy? I don't know. He was hanging on a tree, I think. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, they, you were so expendable because where's the talent? You know, you yeah. jump from you know, studio to studio, production house to production house. It's like, what do we all think? You know, we try to get an opinion because nobody wants to venture, I think this, you know, because it puts you on that line of, of you know, 
you say yes to the wrong thing. So no, you're right about 95% of the time. It's horrible to think about, but that's how much competition is coming through, you know. And mm. every morning on Monday mornings, they're looking at those trades. What what did well this weekend? You know, what what were the you know the ratings on the TV things and stuff? That's what they're looking for because that equates obviously commercial people. You know, it's, yeah. you know, streaming now it just drives me crazy. How many? It's like, well, if you want to see with not commercials, you got to pay this. You know, yeah. uh, or you're gonna you know get interrupted by somebody selling something but it, you know it, it's a business of the show business more than anything else so all we can do is the best stuff we can and hope we can protect it somehow so when it comes out you're going yeah that's that's the movie i wanted to make or you know that's the show i wanted to make but so many chefs in that kitchen now guys mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they were going to do that friday the 13th series a few years back mm-hmm. yeah remember that at paramount right. before yeah. the lawsuit yeah um I talked to um, I think it was, who told me that. I think uh, Dan Dan Ferrant, who does like the the the, the you know, like the he's not in search of the haunting of the haunting of this. He's you know right. really nice guy and stuff. He was part of that group. I think he did. He wrote part five, Halloween, or one of the five, five or six. Hmm. He was a writer on as well. Okay. Um, but Ferrans? He said, hmm? Ferrans? Dan Ferrans? Yeah. Okay. F R F E R R A N D S. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's got a lot of credits. He did he did an incredible job on the Friday uh, ones that were coming out with the special features and stuff in the beginning. Then I think he did never never sleep alone the Friday or the Freddy thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Called something like that. Never but sleep yeah, alone. He, he's a walking never encyclopedia again, yeah. with all this stuff, and he gets all the pieces, and they do a really nice job of, of putting things together. And he was part of that committee that was working on that series. And he said, it was like you get into a room with 14 other people and it's like you throw a piece of meat, you know, and everybody's tearing it in a different way and what they were yeah. going to do. And they, they had a Jason made, you know, a new look. I think they actually had the location that I did Jason lives at, that they were wow. going to shoot at. I mean, it was all kind of moving forward. And then just things just didn't, people couldn't see eye to eye on what they wanted the show to be. and. Oh, yeah. yeah said, apart. We can't have a new group of kids coming in every week just to get killed by Jason. No. <laughs> well, they, they, had, they had this whole, it was going to be like a murder mystery. Right. They didn't know if it was Jason or somebody else impersonating him. And I don't know, does the crowd want to see that? I, I, maybe. I guess I get they pulled it off in some way, like Bates Motel. I mean, that's the one mm. I keep going back to. Mm. I don't want to see, you know, backstory. Psych out with shit. That's good. Fuck me, that's great, you know. <laughs> but it's again the characters, you know. And so when they delivered the horror aspects, it was like, whoa, you know, because you you get kind of you just get deep inside these people, and and now something awful happens, and mm. it's not you don't hate them for it. It's just like I keep forgetting they're disturbed, <laughs> and they got to do things like that. And all the characters in there were so nice, the turns and things that they made, you know, yeah. the show. So the, there was a, it's all out there for you guys, you know. You know, you got to be antennas if I'm pulling the stuff and then hope you get there first. You know, mm. that's, that's always the war. You talking about the studio environment and producers and things like that reminded me of the uh, the old Kevin Spacey movie, Kevin Spacey movie, uh, Swimming with Sharks. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but oh, yeah. that's that's a great kind of little uh, all fictionalized, of course, inside look into the studio. And it seems pretty dead on, but. Um, it, 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 you know, well, like any business, I mean, it's the bottom line is how are we doing, you know, are we getting sales, are, you know, people coming to the thing, is it, and it's all predicated on that. It's like, right. well, there was a snowstorm this weekend, and this happened, and uh, oh yeah, the president got shot, and it, so, yeah, but still, they should have come to, it's like, guys, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, the world does what it's going to do, and we do what we can to entertain, you know, and have some sort of other place to go. But I got to say in the pandemic, the thing that I loved the most about the stupid Zoom stuff was seeing the casts from all these movies that we haven't seen forever. And they don't have to go anywhere. They sit in front of the set like this. And you're seeing all these people from I'm Ferris Bueller, or, uh, you know, Back to the Future. And uh, was it was a Gremlins. They had a bunch of them that this guy would host. And it was like, wow, I mean, where would we see that? We wouldn't put that on regular television, mm. cable, anything, you know, it's like, 
here, all right. You know, they got nothing else to do. They put on a robe and come and sit in front of the computer screen. Right. And, and we get a sense of a whole different reality about that person, too, seeing them you know, in, that, in that situation. Helped us out the pandemic a little bit to get some guests we might not have been able to get otherwise. Right. For sure. Yeah, it helps. It helps. And, it, and all the podcasts, I think, is wonderful, you know. Gives you guys a voice, gives you guys recognition, you know, make good ones. People love seeing these things, seeing what you have to say about it. Oh, I kind of like that. You know, he's, I think he's right. I just it did pretty much suffer. You know, it's like, wait, no, that not only says that, I actually, yeah, I'm going to go back and look at it again because I didn't really. Right. We are so, I, I can't tell you how many movies I've gone to and through the whole movie. I'm going, why am I here? Jesus. You know, you get through the whole thing and then they have a Q&A. And my girlfriend's going, we're not going to stay. You hated this. I go, no, I just want to hear what he has to say. By the end of the Q&A, I want to see the movie again. I yep. didn't see what he talked about. I yeah. missed that altogether. So on one level, his intention failed. Mm. He didn't right. give us what he wanted to. But when I heard what he wanted to, now I kind of want to go back and see where it missed. Because mm -hmm. you learn more from other people's mistakes, and of course your own, than you do when something succeeds. You go, mm. that, why did that work? All yeah. right, I'm going to copy that. Nope. Not going to work a second time. You can't copy well, yourself. I, you can't copy somebody else's success. You can borrow right. certain elements, and maybe it seems new uh, mm -hmm. because you know there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And you can't just say, "Oh, well, that's Jaws. That's all they're doing is Jaws." Here. Well, I love I love the fact that on our show, at least, it's it's three of us. So one week somebody will say, "Yeah, I agree with Red Crank on this one," and then the next week or two weeks later they'll say, "Well, I agree with Colonel on this one." And there's that dynamic, so, you know, nobody ever agrees with me. No one ever agrees <laughs> well, with Zigzag. No. Wrong, no one yeah, no I, one smokes no one smokes that much weed, Ziggy. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love I, and I tell these students this all the time. If you don't like what I'm saying, challenge me. Call me out. Tell yeah. me what's wrong, why that, you know, of course they won't. I go, Come on, "I want criticism you know because i want to hear what you have to, what you're thinking so either i can fix it or go you know what you were right i i should have done this or that or that movie should have done so you know after i do the nose and all the other things about the business you know it's like what, what did you guys see anything on you know a podcast any you know tv series any movie any any you know and try to get a dialogue going and the point of that is I want to hear what he has to think because this guy doesn't know this guy. And when he hears he loves the same movie or whatever, get together, guys. That's a connection. Or this person loves comedy. I, I'm good with writing stories and structure. I don't go pair with him. Go talk about mm -hmm. the movies you like because the, the, you know, those friendships that you make in these film schools, um, you know, we learned from John Carpenter and all the people from USC that, you know, went on to Halloween and fog and all those stuff. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, all over the place. You, you want to find a group of people that you understand, you can trust, you've been in the trenches together, you know how they deal with pressure, you know they got great ideas, and nothing makes me more happy than when somebody says, uh, sir, I have an idea. Yeah, what is it? You know, and of course the ADs are going, don't listen to the craft service guy. I said, I said no, I want to hear what it is. <laughs> and there was a guy, literally, craft service guy that gave me one of the best gags in Date with an Angel. And I spent the rest of the show going, got another good idea for me? You know, and of course, all the food got better. All the, everything. I don't know, he was like a celebrity, you know. And to me, that's what it should be. It's our movie, not mine, ours. And if you can't say that, you know, then you're, you're, you're just a paycheck, you know. And I'd much rather have you into it. And, and if I can't use the idea, I say, that's great. Keep them coming. It's kind of not the way I've seen it. Oh, okay, you know. Don't want to make anybody ever feel bad about it giving an idea because there's a lot of, you know, we're looking at the tree and somebody's got to look at that forest. You yeah. Know, see what the hell are we doing as we're going day by day, you know, yeah. looking at our trees. So, it, you know, the teamwork thing, the crew that really cares and are into it, it is such, such a joy because you really get to celebrate it, you know, as, as a group. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, Catherine has a question here and Ziggy, this kind of steps on, I think one that you were going to talk about. Ah. <laughs> yeah. We got we got to give it to the fans first. Sure. Uh, Catherine says you were both a fun part of my childhood and of my nightmares as a kid. Jabberwocky, nineteen eighty five. Any stories you can share? That was uh, one of my deep cut questions. I was going to bring out at the end. <laughs> you know, I was hired to go in and work with somebody who they were going to hire to be in that Jabberwocky, you know, costume. 
and it was Erwin Allen, you know, who did the Poseidon adventure and all these big movies. And so he was like a bigger than life character. Um, literally had the old bullhorn, action, you know, the, <laughs> you know, and we're shooting, you know, at MGM on the old sound stages and all that. But when I heard the cast, who was going to be in the cast, I went, I'll be the devil. You mm. kidding? Me? You don't, I, no, I'll be the devil. Because I was going to have Ringo standing next to me, <laughs> Jonathan Winters, you know, all these people that are so great, you know, and they come in for a day and you get a chance to, you know, schmooze them and you can, you know, you can say, you know, when, when you're in the locker, yeah, I was with uh, Jonathan Winters, funny guy, you know, you were Com a yeah, you comic genius. All those so, yeah, I, I did the thing and uh, it was it was heavy. There was gas tanks on my back, you know, for the fire coming out, you know, the mouth. Um, I fell in love with Natalie Gregory, who was a little girl. She was so sweet. And up to that point, it's like children, no, nope, no, nope, too big of a kid, can't do it. She was the one that made me go, if I had a little girl like that, you know, I could see being a daddy. Somehow it, that sort of opened up that, that part of me. Um, it's just wonderful. And you want to hear crazy. She's got like brown hair, right? And she kept mm -hmm. coming in and auditioning and they kept going, no, nope, you need a blonde, you know? <laughs> And then some brilliant person went, we could put her in a wig. There's an idea. <laughs> of course, that's what happened. But you know, Thank God of, you're an of, executive. Yeah. A lot of kids got their chains jerked. I'm going in for Alice, you know, and it's like, no, no, no. And the blondes, you know, always had the door open up. But, yeah, the whole experience was really, uh, you know, it was hard because the costume was and things. Um, but there was just so many wonderful things of having you know, to talk with all those people and it, it, it you know, you, you just knew you were kind of in old Hollywood, even though it was a big TV movie. Erwin Allen treated it like we were, you know, he was C.B. C. C. Dumel, and this is the major big thing. Um, the funniest thing that happened was I was chasing, uh, Jabberwocky was chasing Alice down this corridor with torches. And, you know, they went, cut. You know, and so when you're inside those costumes, you know, you hear things like this, you know, and then you kept hearing, you know, you hear the fire, fire. <laughs> and then I heard, uh, somebody want to put the Jabberwocky out, his wings on fire? Somebody want to go put the Jabberwocky out? And sure enough, that one of those wings caught the thing. I can't see it. I was like, you know, it's just flame. So then, you know, in comes the, you know, fire extinguisher, you know, into the holes, you know, I didn't. I, I thought, okay, this is great. You know, die on the set as a Jabberwocky. You know, that never definitely add to the legend. How did he go out? Oh, he went out as a Jabberwocky. Burned up. I also want to go back to uh, 1991. You got a chance to do something that a lot of horror fans m must have dreamed of back in the day, and that was adapting a Stephen King uh, work uh, with Sometimes They Come Back. And I was kind of curious, was Mick Garris not available for this one? Is that why they got to you? Or uh, no, I'm just, I'm just playing. Now, what, what was your experience like on that film? And um, also, Patricia wanted to know, what was it like working with Tim Matheson on that? The Otter. Tim is the greatest guy in the world. I mean, it's like in there with those people where you go, like Dick Van Dyke, who's what, 96 now and still going strong. You know, I wanted to have still you like, that too. gets on stage and sings and dance. I mean, it's amazing. And Tim is like that. He's just like this. You know, I wish everybody in humanity was like a Tim. You know, that's supportive and pleasant and nice and talented and all. You know, he just all of that wrapped up. And I just recently was noticing on photographs of the, of the shoot when I was like in talking or whatever. He and I had the same sort of, you know, half-assed. Um, what they used to call mullet. Kind of hair, you know, let's start here and then. And I went, How did that happen? Did I cut my hair? But no, I don't remember cut. There was so much going on in my life at that time. We survived that movie. Some movies you make, some you survive. Mm. This one was a survival thing. Um, because it just anything that could go wrong went wrong, you know, so many accidents and strange, crazy stuff that occurred. Um, my daughter had just been born two weeks before. My dad had just died, you know, a week mm -hmm. after that. Uh, you know, I had, Mick and I had two TV shows that we were putting um, 20 writers and 20 directors on each one, She Wolf of London, and they came from outer space. I never had so much stuff going 
like the you know the old juggler that had the plates you had to keep going to the plates right, and, yeah. and spin the sticks it was that so by the time i got to kansas you know kansas wasn't home it's like this is kansas wow and so you throw yourself you know into it and it, it really because of tim because of brooke um it really was like there's a warmth you know that we all kind of bonded with and it for me i you know i I didn't say yes to the stand because I had just done this big mini series in a child's name. And I thought, you know, how many days for all that? I don't think so. You know, <laughs> wasn't smart, but this one I said yes to. And of course it was Dino and he, right. you know, one of the last books or things he had the rights to. So it was an you know, opportunity. I didn't want to make a TV movie. I wanted to make a feature and Dino was going, don't worry, we're going to make this big screen. Like, uh, he put a wide screen for it. So when we're shooting it, I had to look at the monitor like this, you know, or masked out, and then TV, you know, yes. and kept, you know, trying to frame so it worked for both, which isn't easy. Um, but yeah, it did have a you know a decent distribution and did do well overseas. When I was in Germany last year, there was books and shit on it, you know, and there, I was signing DVDs. It's like holy shit, you know, it's amazing. You go out out of our little, you know, hole here and there's a whole nother world out there with yeah. fandom. But yeah, it, it just, I got so many stories, but if you, again, you know, one is, I don't know what they're charging for that stupid book, but my book, I've got a whole chapter on just this because there was so okay. much about it and shooting on Indian burial ground yeah. that somehow made certain sense for some of the weird ass shit that was happening. Um, but yeah, it, and at the end of the day, that movie just has been for a lot of people like this warm horror hug. You know, I really wanted to be about family. And obviously Tim and I sort of like kind of merged somehow in the, in the doing of the story uh, you know, along the way that I didn't really realize. And uh, Carrie Pomeri, who did the score, it's like, if I got the music at my funeral, I want that theme. Uh -huh. That theme to mm -hmm. me is so haunting and so beautiful and so melancholy, you know, it, it, then when the strings soar and stuff, I just thought that's a really cool piece. And I just love that, you know, that that's associated with something that I did. So it, it has all these other aspects to it now that, you know, at the time it was like, God, we got to get through this. It's supposed to be 27 days of 36. You know, I should have been fired, you know, 10 times <laughs> over. But, you know, we get on the phone with me. Bah! You're giving me a goddamn good movie. Yes, sir. Do it. Put the producer back on. I love your Dino impersonation, by the way. I love it every time I hear it. And I think, uh, as Stephen King adaptions go, this one's not, it's good. It's in the top. You know, I mean, I mean, he's got his big monsters, of course. This is like a lesser known uh, story that, you know, it's not like Carrie or Christine mm -hmm. or anything like that, but it, yeah. it still delivers. And the, the cast is there and it's very strong. Uh, yeah, Robert Russler has that, you know, the lead guy. He's great. And those three guys watching them fuck around and do the things that they did. I was in hysterics. I mean, they were just the funniest, wise guys. But boy, you would not want to be that kid at school that they targeted in the bathroom. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Those are the guys, you know, in their smoke and going, oh, come on in. And, I, and all that stuff, we just did so well. He was funny. We just ran into him at, uh, uh, at a convention a few months ago, and he was on a weird science panel. Oh, and yeah. so, you know, they called Vernon, you know, the, the guy from uh, a Road Warrior, you know, the, the Mohawk yeah. guy. And he said hi to everybody on the mic. And then he was like, oh, that was fun. Let's call Robert Downey. So he dials it, gets his number, and it says, hi, you've reached, you know, starts and giving the phone number, right? Yeah. And he's like, oh. So Crank here goes at night and makes a fake tweet from Robert Downey. Stating like, yeah, with all these missed calls from Cincinnati, so that's where we were. Uh -huh. And he goes, yeah, you know, Robert's got to keep his fucking mouth shut, you know. And then Crank goes up and shows him, you know, I've got pictures. I couldn't get my camera going quick enough, but I got. He's like absolutely in terror, like. <gasps> and then he's, he's like, wait a minute, Crank had missed one letter in his last name, one of the S's. I so put two, I put two S's in his name instead yeah. of one, and he got. But he went from mortified for a split second to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Good try. Because uh, Bob knows how to spell my last name, asshole. <laughs> Man, that was ballsy. Uh, ballsy. Oh, I love those things. <laughs> Maybe pull it off. 
scare the uh, hell out of people. <laughs> I, I think I had had a few too many drinks that night, so my proofreading was not where it was supposed to be at, at two, three o'clock in the morning. But you know, it um, almost worked. Almost. With with the Stephen King uh, area that we're in right now, I wanted to ask if you could write and direct, or just direct any Stephen King adaptation. Wow, what would you do, and how would you make it a fresh retelling? I, I, you you got to have a dream I, scenario I, here. It's like I would not want to remake anything that's been done, even though there's a few that could use, you know, a, a different approach to what they <laughs> did. And it's a weird balancing act because there's a sense of humor, obviously, in King's stuff, but it's always grounded in something that's very, um, you know, humane in a way that that's uh, the thing I always say that when you read a Stephen King novel, you are in the heads of these characters, you know, mm -hmm. um, the little boy, obviously, in The Shining, or mm. you know, the uh, Christopher Walken's character, um, you know, in Dead, Firestar, Dead Zone. I mean, not Firestar, uh, Dead Zone. The Dead Zone, yeah. And, and very few movies get that intimacy of getting inside the characters and and living the story through them. It's so much of the time. Well, this is a spectacular effect at this moment or whatever, and trying to figure out, you know, how you get either the creep thing or the fact that this is going to destroy my sanity or this is going to destroy my relationship. You know, it needs to be grounded in some way. Um, Cujo, I mean, my God, what a mm. terrifying thing, being in a car with a little kid and the way they played it. And, you know, and then later, you know, you find out it's like it's freezing and <laughs> completely different than what the magic was that we saw on the screen. Right. And just having, you know, man's best friend being that savage and that the term, I mean, that again is those elements of child, mother, and animal, beast, you know, coming at you so old school primitive, you know, how are they going to get out of this? And it, it was just amazing. I, I, I'm so <laughs> curious on the, the cocaine bear, you know. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, and the claustrophobia, the claustrophobia of Cujo, yeah. them stuck in that little pinto it's for so a long. Hard watch. It's still a hard watch, some of those yeah. scenes, man. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's that's kind of what you want. It's right. Thing of, okay, I survived that. Now, you know, I don't want to go back again. And then there's, you know, geeks like us going, I want to see that again. That was great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had nightmares all night. You want a nightmare? Oh, off of something like that? Yeah, it was fun. You know. Tell you, when you get older, though, when the nightmares start to be about your kids and other things, they have fun no more. You know, right. it's like, yeah, oh, shit, I'm awake. Oh, thank God, you know. Oh, yeah, I've, I've had a few of those. Those are awful. Those are yeah, the worst. They are. They are. You know, I never remembered any of those, though. It's funny. You know, yeah. I just remember, like, the really cool things. I went, there's a movie in that. Uh, so, you know, I write them down. I used to have a thing that was called a, a dream writer. It was a pen that you had next to your bed and the notepad. And when you put the, the, the tip onto the paper, uh, it illuminated the paper. So mm -hmm. you didn't have to turn on any lights and anything. You just could you just see what you're writing and then put it down back to bed again. And I love that because there was mm. Fellini taught me that, you know, you've got to write things from your dreams or images from your dreams and stuff. And so much of his stuff was purely from the dream realm, stuff that obviously subconsciously got into his head. And I want to cast somebody who looks like this and somebody like this. And, you know, and that's, that's great cinema to me because it's like, are you ripping off anybody else? Nope. <laughs> Just taking it from whatever the hell comes out of me. You know, right. it's true artistry. Is is there a story though that you can think of of his that you know, I, you'd I like to I do? Getting, or? Uh, before I, you know, for a mime, I sure talk a lot. You know, that's I've learned that. <laughs> I, I was the guy who never spoke. Now I'm on stage, you know, tearing my clothes off and doing all this crazy shit. It's like it took me a while to get out of that shyness. Um, but. I don't know a lot of the newer ones mm -hmm. because the one bad thing is I've gotten so addicted to the media that books just, you know, even scripts, you know, it's like, I really want to read this and I get to about page 20. And then I realized I was reading to go to sleep for a long time. So mm -hmm. I got to deprogram that. And right. so books, forget about it. You know, I've got I so got many books that I promise I'm going to read. I'm going to read. And I really do try, but then it's like, okay, I got to pay taxes. I got to pick up the kids. I got to, you know, there's so many other things. And if I'm going to sit down for two hours, it's like, 
I want to see a fucking movie. I don't know. I just yeah. that. <laughs> and I want to see it in the theater. You know, we were we were at the drive-ins when the whole pandemic pandemic first started because it's like okay, we're <laughs> we'll watch it from a car, but there's yeah. still other people. You know, it's just this crazy addiction. You know, to that, and it really is an addiction. It's like you feel like start jonesing if you haven't seen something. You know, no. in a while. Yeah, but no, you want no, to see no. something good. There's nothing worse than watching something. But we just watched last night. I was so disappointed. Um, something that was like a twist on Dracula. Um, but it was like these these women that brought this guy in. I think it was on Hulu, House of Darkness or something like that. But I, I, I think like you're a, right. I think you're right. I think it's called House of Darkness. And I, don't know. I mean, well, you know, incredible set or house, whatever you know, that all took place in one place, but. It just, you know, felt like actors acting and felt like a play, you know, more than being like in a movie. And there really is a difference between photographing people talking and doing things. And even when they had, I mean, the, the gore at the end is great. I mean, it didn't come out, you've been lulled into, you're never going to see anything you're going to talk about later. But they really did have a great bite that really delivered. Um, but the whole ride, I kept going. I don't, why did that guy go on so much about this? I'm gonna sit it out. I'm gonna sit it out. You know, it's so easy to that remote and go fuck you. You know, and don't yeah. shudder. Um, but it's like, you know, it just disappoints me so many times. And you go, all right, I know that rule. You don't do a lot of talking. You know, it's you got to show people. You got to feel, you know, like uh, uh, what the what's his face did with the haunting of Hill House, the remake. Um, Flanagan. Flanagan, Mike Flanagan. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was so immersed in. The, the, the actors and the subtleties and where the ghosts were that you had if you watch it again they were actually there i just didn't notice them mm. and it, you know i just think he's brilliant i think mm -hmm. taking on what's one of my favorite movies and stretching it for what eight episodes and right. delivered it and i think that was part six it was all what felt like all one shot it was so beautifully oh, orchestrated i mean I, you know and i i, I finally raved about him at a fangoria uh, awards thing and i said you're my new maestro and he goes oh i love what you do and i go i'm sorry you know you're, you're delivering on a whole nother level that i wished i had delivered but you know in the 80s it was like popcorn movies you know you know and we were all going look at all the shit they did in the 70s it's star wars and rocky <laughs> and godfather and what is direct we're doing fuck you yeah. you know <laughs> we didn't know we were creating the monsters for the future you know yeah. there's no frankenstein there's no dragon and then, you know, now people are going like, that was the golden age. It was like, yep. you have no idea the way we were thinking. You know? And you try your best to bring in as much of yourself or something that make you go, no, I'm glad I'm doing this because I get to do this or get that, that. But so many people were just, far, you know, phoning it in, you know, let's get it done this many days, you know, um, get in, get out, you know, when's the tit shot? Wait, he's not putting <laughs> a tit shot in there? What's the matter with it? The audience is going to boom. I mean, I went through that with mine. And it wasn't because I wasn't planning it. It was in the script. Darcy just said, I'm kind of uncomfortable. Do you really have to have it? And I go, no. In fact, it will probably make the comedy better for the, the jokes. Um, yeah. So we took it out. And, you know, now when I go to shows, it's like, you know, anybody upset about that? You know, and like a couple goes, yeah. And I went, oh, you want to see tips? And I pulled my shirt up. You know, There's your tips for you. Well, but, yeah, Darcy and I did a wonderful photo together Darcy did this whole calendar of, of her and Jason and stuff and he did one with me in a motorhome with me straddling her with my oh. shirt off covering myself like that and Jason looking through the window you know and her's just looking very seductive it's awesome like, we, we got to do that you know awesome. for all those people that <laughs> like me to take the top off there you go well see that's why I appreciate I love you know Jason lives anyway anyway but once my old, oldest daughter was old enough to start showing her some of these horror movies, my go-to is Jason Lives because, yeah, I still made her cover her eyes, which to me is weird because, you know, I was a boy. I had to cover my eyes boobies as a kid. I mean, she's, mm -hmm. she's a female. And she's she has them. Day, but yeah. I'm programmed to cover your eyes. But it's, now, it's nice now I can watch it with her, and I still don't feel too uncomfortable because <laughs> it's implied but not really shown. You know, I think it's just like the it's like the safe way, it's the gateway to Friday the Thirteenth for me. You know, it's funny you say that because I've heard that so many times. Like the gateway drug, it's like mm -hmm. you never see one of these. All right, start with six. 
Yep. If you like that, now now go back, see the first one, move your way through, whatever. But I thought the fans were going to hate it because of the humor um, and the, you know breaking the fourth wall, and, you know, the, and just all the stuff I put in that I didn't know how that they would respond to that. Um, and it was just great to hear laughter and screams and all that going on in the theater. Um, and it was just me kind of rolling the dice. Well, this is what would be fun to me. And I didn't have anybody say, no, no. Mm. Frank was just so supportive. Frank Mancuso Jr. It was, just, it was great to have a producer like that. I think you also, you, you, you put the story back on. You know, you, you revive Jason again, and we have Tommy trying to finish it. It was Finally. back on track. Yeah, we're yeah. right back on where we wanted to, where we never wanted to leave. So, I mean, that's yeah. that's it. That's that's what it was. And Well, the other thing, too, in stories, as you know, it's it's obviously wants and needs. Mm. It, this one wants this, and this is the conflict, you know, and that one, you know, wants to stop this one or whatever. And I kind of just put in that basic rule. Tommy went with one agenda, and he snapped, and he fucked up, and what he did caused Jason to come back. Now he's got to do something because people are dying and they're looking at him, you know, and he did do it <laughs> in his own yeah. way. But, you know, through the movie, his, you know, agenda is I got to stop Jason again. And finally, you know, he comes up with this sort of, you know, kind of classic, you know, you move the tombstones, but you, <laughs> you left the bodies kind of thing. He's, you know, this what he found out is wherever somebody, you know, died, you need to get them back to that original place. So that was that whole thing with the chain and the, and the, uh, the rock. All the great monsters, you know, Dracula said it, you know, to be dead, to be really dead must be glorious. You know, <laughs> Frankenstein, love dead, hate living. You know, obviously a werewolf, hated being the werewolf. So I thought Jason was happy down there. He was fine. This motherfucker brings him back and he's going to get him. And so go back to Crystal Lake, all the kind of places he knows. And anybody that's in the path on the way there, bam, you know, so it's like, no matter what he did, he was still going for his target. You know, that was it. Mm -hmm. And that gave two, you know, agendas there. And I think a lot of the people, it's kind of like, you're curious to see how, what are they going to do next? And we're seeing all these people going down um, and trying to do it in some sort of clever and impossible to, you know, a normal person can't twist the head and you know, pull it off, you know, this superhuman punch out the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, bigger than life stuff. I, I just didn't want to just do you know slash a throat, you know, easy. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 I wanted him to be a monster. You know, in the old classic way of how are you going to stop that? How do you kill something that's already dead? You know, kind of mentality. But I never ever <laughs> thought he was a zombie, but he's kind of what this become. You know, pre-zombie hmm. Jason or post-zombie Jason. I, said, I hear that. I even had the sheriff shoot him right in the head. You know, right. and he comes back. I said, if he was a zombie, that would have been it, right? Is he eating anybody? No. You know, so, yeah. but, you know, to me, it was Frankenstein. You know, I'm very oh. open about that's how you bring somebody back. Lightning bolt, mm -hmm. Karloff's market, you know, it's going to be the nods are going to be there. And, you know, when Frank is Frankenstein, you know, it's going to keep going. You know? Someone was detecting so, the front door. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon's late with that delivery. Yeah. yeah right. I will say I I uh back when it came out, I, I got the novel for Jason Lives. And it oh, got it it got into it explained Jason's point of view after the lightning strike. He no longer needed to eat. He no longer needed to sleep. He was kind of just, you know, animated. A machine. But, yeah, just a machine I now. But it was, I thought that was it was a nice it, it explained a lot to it, you know. It just kind of yeah. gave you a little light. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. He just kind of ran with the ball. And of course he had the original script. So Jason's father was in there mm. as well at the end. So I remember that. It's, uh, it, it's going to be really interesting to see what is going to happen with all of this. Um, yeah. And I, every so often I go, do I really want to go back and try to like do something that just happened to work? I mean, none of us knew what was going to, any of those movies were going to have the longevity that they had. And now to consciously go in and go, oh, all right, well, I want to try to give them what they want, but I also want to give them something they didn't know they wanted until they see it. And that's the old Steve Jobs statement about the Mac. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, you don't know you need this yet. Mm. You know? Right. <laughs> Damn, you know, that instinct was right. Um, so it's, all, it's a, to me, 
the sequels that deliver exactly what you figured it was going to, not always that fun. You know, the ones that kind of give you what you want the movie to give you and don't copy the first one, they just take it like another level. And then if there's any way to do something that's like, I never even thought about that. And that's that surprise, you know, that surprise element I think is so, so important um, if you're trying to repeat the success of something or at least try to get that same audience you know, to come back and be happy about what they saw and not yeah. like, yeah, the first one was better. I had one final thought on uh, part six. Um, it's notoriously known that the MPAA got a hold of it and just chopped it out. How how much more was really there, like, nine more times. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was right. nine, we had nine screenings. When we got down to the ninth one, you know what they were picking on? The back then. Mm -hmm. a bloody gory back then um so i i had to take out one or two two shots of him bending back and jason pushing harder we did that it's like okay and it was like what is the deal with that and, and a little bit of the audio is that right hmm? a little bit of the audio also on that is that right with the of the back breaking snapping a couple of sounds sound effects Maybe, but I know when I was doing the, the Screen Factory one, I jacked up a lot of stuff if I didn't like it. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, to be honest, I, I don't remember that. I always remember the visual stuff that, you know, they were mainly objecting to anything they, they thought was excessive. So there's no kills that were ever taken out. It's not like, you know, John right. Dupler's one where they just tore that. Butchered it. Um, I, my stuff was all like, you know, he presses the... the, the cop's head and so you see this little crack but if the shot continued you see a piece of his brain kind of come up in a piece of the, of the uh, skull so it just it's a little more that you know repulsive the three uh paintballers yeah triple decapitation you actually saw the blade go across and you saw the three heads go boom 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 yes. you know and these guys worked hard to get that they were so mad you know um just, and so what some fell some fool at the uh, studio that's uh, all that all that footage is just taken you don't know where it goes after it's removed it's not in a vault somewhere it's never going to appear we're never going to see it ever some of it's, it's in the bonus footage it's somewhere right it's somewhere you know and usually what happens you know in the film days you know you, these were trims and you know you put tape around it and you said you know continuation of cop's head kind of thing and you put it in a box and it goes on a shelf someplace. Supposedly, mm. people have looked all over Paramount and the vaults, all the rest of that, mm -hmm. and have not seen anything of that. The best I can ah. come up with is that we had made a PHS uh, tape of uh, off the uh, editing screen fairly early on when we were getting the cuts. And I don't even know why we did it, but I'm kind of glad we did because there, hmm. you know, I could put that on the extra features, and so you get right. a little piece of this here and here. But still we already had started cutting on the stuff, so they didn't really get the full effect. And, you know, I went about this with Frank going, they are going to kill you and that don't go crazy with this. You know, I know that's what everybody wants, you know, <laughs> so I'll, I'll do three versions basically, you know, how far we want to go with it or how far I can get away with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, it wasn't celebrating how much gore it was hopefully saying, Oh, I didn't want her to die. I liked her. You know, and, and the same thing with the Paula character, you know, you never saw what happened to her, but that was a bloodbath in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, she must have some, you know, a lot of blood in that body because the whole room was painted with that. And, you know, it's, it, and some, sometimes those are the things that really like get people more because it's like, oh my God, what happened to you? What the hell happened? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Eh, all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I, I mentioned uh, your friend Mick Garris a few minutes ago. Um, I'd always been kind of curious, did you guys ever talk about doing something together, either writing something together or him writing, you directing, you writing, him directing, anything like that? Because that would be a killer yeah. uh, collaboration for the horror community, I thought. Well, we actually did do a couple things together. Um, okay. You know, I met Mick, we had a screening of One Dark Night at um, USC. It was a thing, I think they're still around, the Academy of, of, of the Movie horror and fantasy and science fiction, something like that. And so after the screening, you know, Mick came up to me and, you know, 
he was basically, you know, a publicist that wants to be a filmmaker and just, you know, loved it. And we both kind of hit it off instantly. Mm -hmm. And so that was like 83, I guess, or so. And, you know, we've been close friends for all this time. I mean, it's amazing um, how, how well we stayed in touch. And at one point, Nick um, got onto Amazing Stories, this Spielberg thing. Mm -hmm. And right. you know, he brought me in, as, you know, to write one of the things okay. with him, uh, which was the go, go to the head of the class, that Christopher Walken, not Chris, uh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> uh, Back to the Future. Uh, you know, uh, the, oh, right, um, Back to the Future. Uh, oh, doctor, Chris, doctor, Doctor. Chris, yeah. Chris, the fuck? yeah Doc, the, the doctor doctor Emmett Brown, but the future. yeah. Nelson, not Nelson. Yeah. No. Um, Lambert? No, I Lambert. Oh, I'm glad you can't remember either. I always yeah, none of us can remember, so it's all right. Fuck. <laughs> Somebody will throw anyway, it in the comments. So much pot. It, it, you know, we we're very happy with the way you know, Lloyd that came out because you never know. Christopher Lloyd, the director gets it and all that. And then I did another one there uh, as well. And then Mick was on the thing for I think I think he ended up being like story editor and worked on a number of those. Okay. Things. Um, and then the others was a series that also Spielberg was uh, producing, and that was a very cool idea with these five or six people that all had gifts and they all lived together and they would solve crimes and missing pe persons kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, you know, Nick brought me in to do one of those, direct one of those uh, episodes. And then we did, you know, uh, Universal came to us and said, "We got all these." Universal movies, all these titles. Love to make series out of some of this stuff. You know, why don't you guys take a look, see what you like? So Nick and I immediately yeah. saw American Werewolf in London. And went, mm. all right, that. <laughs> and you know, he and he knew John quite well. So I said, Well, we better go talk to him first because don't want to get John <laughs> upset. And he goes, you know, hey, you guys want to do that? Sure, that's fine. Yeah. But I don't know how you're gonna do poly the polygraph. What do you mean? It's like, it turns out Universal didn't own it, you know, polygraph it. So, uh, oh. you know, that didn't happen. So then I, we went back to the archives and I saw She Wolf, you know, of, of London. And it was like, well, wait a minute, that could be pretty cool, you know. And then came up yeah. with the scenario that she's an American, she goes over there, it's a bit, you know, studying the supernatural, meets this English scholar guy, and, you know, sort of the X Files except one of them is actually a werewolf trying to find a cure. So we, we collaborated on that script and, you know, to said oversaw the bringing in of the directors and the other writers and stuff, you know, on that. Um, okay. So there was one other thing that we did. Uh, I just, I see them so much. Because I was working all the time, so I missed, I was at all the dinners for the Masters of Horror, but I wasn't mm -hmm. around for when they were doing the series. Again, mm. got some very cool stuff in that as well. Yeah, great guy. Yeah. Um, after around 1989 or so, you started working in TV a lot with movies and, and miniseries, movies of the week, things like that. Um, when you did this, you kind of became this go to director for like real life horrors and true crime kind of situations, like. Mm -hmm. The DC sniper, the AIDS epidemic, global warming, things like that. Uh, in fact, uh, where it is? There it is, I think. Uh, Tarek says one of his favorite underrated performances was Charles S. Dutton in Alien Three. In are there any interesting notes directing him in DC Sniper? Um, his displayed emotion was done really well. He. You want to expand on that at all with uh, Charles? Oh, I, I, I could go for an hour on, on Charles. I mean, that we're here as long as you want to be, I, sir. No. You don't want to hear me for an hour. This, this has been hard <laughs> enough endurance task. How long have we been doing this anyway? Don't worry about oh, yeah. that yet. It's, we're wrapping up here. <laughs> um, but Charles, I don't know if anybody knows his backstory, but um, he stabbed and killed when he was like 16 and he was one badass guy and mm -hmm. ended up going into prison and um and he fought everybody you know guards and shit so they kept putting him in solitary confinement and as he tells the story you know there's a guy that rolls down the the, the 
books, you know, and the thing. It's like, anybody want a book? And so they, you know, he had this much under the door, you know, where the light came through. And they can slide a couple of things through. One of them was a book on acting. And so as he tells it, you know, he's laying on this freezing concrete floor next to that little tiny light coming under the door, you know, reading this thing. And it just spoke to him. And he started to put on plays at the penitentiary and realized, you know, he was really good at pretend, you know, and could, could pull this off. And then he left uh, there and he went to, um, what's the big uh, uh, Harvard, uh, from prison yard to Harvard. Harvard is <laughs> like they, they did art stories about that. And he got into the acting thing there and then kind of just took off. So here's a guy that you knew had one hell of a childhood and the ghetto mm-hmm. sister that was, I think, still having uh, drug addiction issues and stuff. And yet he was the most lovable, easy to talk to kind of guy. Um, and we would get into these stories and like we were both studying, you know, this thing had just happened, you know, six months earlier. And they weren't even convicted yet, you know, Malvo and, and Mohammed. And I was getting FBI people breaking gag orders to tell me stuff that hadn't been revealed yet. Um, one of those was the walkie talkies because nobody could figure out how this kid in the back could shoot through that tiny little hole across a freeway and nail somebody at a gas station, you know, that low like that. Mm-hmm. Well, Mohammed was sitting there, you know, in the car with the walkie talkie, you know, when he saw it was all clear, you know, you clear. And then the kid would just sh- fire. You know, you could see the target, but there was not going to be any cars that were going to hit it. Yeah. So I added the, you know, the more kind of ominous thing. You know, praise Allah. You know, praise Allah. Boom. So it was. It's Muhammad. He was about as much of a Muslim as I am. I you know it was a, for him. He was trying to get his wife back. She was Muslim, so he was putting on this whole show and he was trying to believe it and stuff. And he was one piece of work. But there was a lot of things that he did, starving the kid, you know, wouldn't feed him until he executed something really well that he, you know, said that now you're a man. And it was his father and son story that was just dark, but it got, it really got down to love in its own twisted way. You know, he was mm. doing this because his wife took the kids and he wanted to shoot all these people in the area. So when she got shot, she was just one of the many you know, that were being shot in the area. That was his plan until this thing became a terrorist thing, which was, again, a mistake. Somebody saw a white van pull away, and for somehow that was terrorism, and it just took off, and the world was scared. I mean, I was looking at news yeah. footage from London, Paris, people at gas stations, you know, ducked down and shit. It was just a very, very bizarre story. But getting back to Charles, there was this one thing when a little boy got shot, and he has this press conference with all the, you know, all the press from all over the world standing there. And, you know, I said to him, you know, this is the only time Moose actually cried. Um, you know, do you think that's possible? And he said, let me give it a shot. And just like, and I'm telling you guys, right exactly where Mo- the real Moose had a tear roll down, he managed to do that. And another one, I went, how the fuck does he do that? I mean, yeah. amazing actors, you know, to get it right when you wanted it, you know, at that point. So it absolutely matched what really happened. So, but, you know, it, it was an incredibly strange movie to be up in Vancouver, Canada, trying to recreate American gas stations and, um, you know, the whole depots and all right. that stuff. It was, mm-hmm. you know, interesting challenge, just like Murder in Greenwich. We were in Auckland, New Zealand. All the cars are on the opposite side. The steering wheels are on the opposite side. We're trying to do the 70s um, and look like, you know, Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, down in, uh, you know, in New Zealand. But we, we pulled it off. And again, I had a great cast, Christopher Maloney, and, uh, Robert Forster. You know, it's always about the actors for me. It's always being able to bond with them and get into the heads of these characters. Then, you know, what are they thinking? Is there anything I can help you, you know, with and turn to and, Donald Sutherland was was the best mm. relationship I ever had with an actor because every night at rap he'd come and say, We're having dinner, Governor. I said, I guess the governor's coming to you. So I would have dinner with him every night and we'd talk about the next day's work 
And he goes through the script and go, I don't need to say that. I don't need to say that. I'm not going to cut the other actor. Don't, don't, <laughs> it's my mistake. But I'm already playing that. Why should I say it as well? It's redundant. And, and again, it was brilliant that way. Mm, just and that was for part. that was for behind the mask, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I actually that was the one one of the TV movies I was able to watch during uh, this last week, um, oh, yeah. and I was going to bring that up because, man, that was uh, such a heartwarming story. Uh, and a true story about those two people meeting and uh, kind of both needing each other at the at the same time. Yeah. And I, I, I really enjoyed the way you took on that. But I had also heard that you got attached to that movie because Marlon Brando wanted to play Donald Sutherland's ta- uh, role at first. Please, yeah. tell, please tell us about that meeting with Marlon Brando. Please, please. <laughs> that was... If you could imagine sitting for three hours with the Godfather and Colonel Kurtz, I mean, <laughs> you know, he was in this, I guess they used to call them moo-moos, these big mm-hmm. black things, you know, that just kind of hit all his girth. But you walk in, um, he had like a couple of dogs running around. Get the fuck out of here. He's doing it. Yeah. You know, and he <laughs> sat down with me, the producer, and the writer who wrote Rain Man, who did the script, Barry. Um, and he had a coffee table huge just packed with sushi every kind of sushi in the world so of course he's sitting there going eat eat oh fucking sushi what am i gonna do with it, you know, eat it. <laughs> and of course you know we're we're starstruck i mean to try it you know like i guess put a hunk of fish in your mouth and talk to brando i mean you know but just to watch him um just be i mean it's like he, he's, he's like crazy but at the same time, this genius. And one of the perfect examples of that is I, you know, I'd always heard when he did uh, Countess from Hong Kong that, you know, Charlie Chaplin and, um, was that uh, Sophia Lauren? I remember the woman that, that, that I think it was, you know, Chaplin was directing it, it was Marlon Brando and I think it was Sophia. That sounds about right. And I'm not positive, but. I had always heard that, you know, I mean, when Chaplin directed, he showed you. If you were the woman, you know, you pick this up like this, and you turn, and you know, he pantomimed it out, and he wanted mm-hmm. to do exactly that. And so I heard that, you know, Brando, the method actor, was not standing for that, and so there was nope. a lot of shit on the set. So I mm-hmm. thought, okay, I, I got to tell you, I mean, my big hero has always been, you know, Chaplin. Really fucking mm-hmm. scenes. And I go, yeah. Uh, what was that like? I thought you guys you could know, it's like, it's like, you got along like this. And, and then he just sort of veers off and talks about electricity, our planets, you know, just this weird, like, freak out, kind of <laughs> take me someplace else. And then, then he stops and says, you ever see city lights? That last scene in city lights and city lights. And then he proceeds to act and talk about every movement that Chaplin did in that the end of City Lights and what the title cards said, you know, all the way to the end, you know, the last moment with Chaplin with his doing this, he had the flower and he's biting his lip. And, you know, and he was totally into the character in that moment. And you're just sitting there going, okay, that was crazy, that ride, but that's genius. I mean, he, like he just saw the movie and he was explaining what he just saw yeah. And that movie, obviously, you know, probably haven't seen it for 40, 50 years. <laughs> so it was, you know, it was just amazing to be in his presence. But then one time it got awkward. Uh, this was at the time with the Bill Clinton uh, scandal. Oh. And, you know, he looks at Barry, he looks at Stan, he looks at me, and he goes, what man here wouldn't take a blowjob? From Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why I went, me. You're an asshole. Why? I know, well, I'm married. You're a bigger asshole. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I just thought I'd be honest. You know? I, but, I like the, you know, I like the sentiment, Tommy, but I have to agree with Marlon on that. You're kind of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no way, <All> man. <laughs> But, you know, I, I didn't find her that attractive. I'm sorry. You know, but no, again, that's fair enough. Fair uh, enough. But, yeah, I mean, somebody called Marlon back in the day, you know, sex on a stick. 
you know, he just attracted everybody, you know, everybody, every woman wanted to be with him. And he made sure he was with as many as he could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the reason he was even doing the movie was because it was going to take three weeks to shoot his part. He got a million dollars a week. Right. Whether he showed up or didn't show up. So the production went behind schedule too fucking bad. You know, he's getting three million. Why? No, no, no. He's got an island and he's got a shit ton of alimonies, you know, <laughs> waves out there going, come on. So, yeah. you know, that's why he did it. And then you go to, you go, okay, you know, he wants me. We're fine. We're going to do it. Um, we go to Toronto. I start picking locations. We open the production offices. Everybody in Hollywood wanted to play a role in that. Marlon was in it, mm -hmm. and uh, um, who was uh, uh, oh god, what's his name? And <laughs> you know, yeah, um, Matthew Fox. Jacket. Oh no, the, the the one that goes crazy and shoots himself. You know, private. Oh, Lyle. Vincent D'Onofrio. D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio. D'Onofrio was supposed to play, you know, Jim James, whatever the character's last name was. Mm -hmm. um, so that was great, and then. I was getting calls from everybody. And then there was a point when Sean Penn was going to come and then Christopher Penn came instead. Um, <laughs> it, it was just all the stuff, you know. And when I went out and talked to every director that was still alive that had worked with Brando, he said, you know, can I give you a piece of advice? He said, yeah. Run. Don't walk. Run. He will tear <laughs> you fucking apart. You have no idea what he did and starts listing off all the mm -hmm. directors and all the horrible things either they did to him or somebody. He will research you and find stuff to bring up in front of the crew. You know, like, you don't worry about how he got that. And yeah. I kept going, yeah, I know, I know. But, you know, don't say because it's Marlon Brando, you're going to you're gonna choke on those words. <laughs> it's, like, it's a line from Harold and Maude, you know, I want to have something to talk about in the locker room, you know, it's one of those kind of events. So we're up there, we're prepping, we start casting locally for some of the other parts, and then I get a call from CBS, he's walked away. What do you mean he's walked away? He's not going to do the picture now. Why? Because he wants to change the roles. He wants to play Jim, Jim the retarded guy, and somebody else can play the fuck. And I go, he, I mean, he He's, he's way he's too so, old. How, how are we going to believe that? Because that's not all of it. This is the writer. He says he wants to play the part on the back of a motorcycle throwing toilet paper to the pool. That's what he wants. So CBS went, I'm sorry, Mr. Brando. Goodbye. So we <laughs> shut down. You know, the whole unit comes back. You know, going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So. Donald Sutherland's name came up, and I went, he would be great. He's so wonderful. But the head of CBS goes, no, he's, you know, he's like the bad guy. You know, you can see him, he's not going to have any heart or whatever. So do you ever see ordinary people? You know, any yeah. of those things. I mean, this man it just exudes warmth and, you know, and she had just seen some of the more recent things. So mm -hmm. we finally, you know, talked her into it, and then we went to Vancouver and started the process all over. And then... Uh, Whoever is the CBS head at that time? What? Press. Somebody. Um, he got bounced out for some reason. But he insisted that, I mean, Gary Sinise wanted to play James, the retarded one. And then mm. he said, when do you start? It's like, oh, I'm two weeks. I can't, no, I can never prepare for a part like this in two weeks. Yeah. And so any of the people we wanted that were of caliber, you know, they wouldn't do it with that short amount of prep. So then I hear they want Matthew Fox. Who's that? Party Five. What's that? The show on, <laughs> on Fox. Never heard of it. You know? Yeah. The kid, you know. So I go in and look it up, and I go, "He's a model. He's a gorgeous model. James has no teeth. You know, he's got all this ratty hair and shit. It's like, you know, wigs and hey, guy, does he have the chops to do this? This is this. You know, you know, Wes wants. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you know." So I said, you need to go to this acting teacher that I've worked with, because at least if we can talk the same language, you know, about the moments and things, that would really help. I think it right. went once. Then I find out 
he's shooting party of five in Los Angeles while we're shooting in Canada and in Vancouver. So he would have to finish the day, get on a plane, come to us, get into the wig. Um, wow. Rick Baker was very nice and made teeth for him. And there is a favor. And, you know, he'd come to the set. Now, he really cared. i got to say, he really wanted to be good. And he really, you know, he said, I know I'm not qualified for this, but if you just <laughs> do everything you can to make me look good kind of thing. And, of course, working opposite Donald, it's very hard not to up your game. Right. And so it, it really helped. But there was times where I was pushing him and pushing him and put again, what more do you want? You know, you know, I can't do that. I cannot do that role. Boom, you had to go into so I did pull all these old emotional tricks and things. Mm -hmm. But afterwards he said, Thank you. You know, I would have never mm -hmm. gotten there unless you did that to me. So at the end of the day, it, the whole movie came out, I thought, really well, you know, for kind of a little soft fathered son with another yeah. son coming into the picture. Um, Bradley Brad, Whitford. Brad, yeah, Br I mean, such a great actor. Yeah, so I love that guy. Success that he's had. Um, and yeah, there are lots of crazy Donald stories along the way, too, uh, on that one. But yeah, the, the greats always have these other aspects to them that's so interesting, you know, when you get a chance to kind of see behind the curtain. Amazing. Well, shoot, before Very we let you go, man. Um, hey, don't say that. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> I got to get some water eventually. I'm, I'm saying, guys, he's dehydrated over here, for God's yeah. sake. But, uh, well, I, I just wanted to ask, you know, what can we expect from Tom McLaughlin? What's coming? Do you have anything in the pike that we would be, as horror fans, excited about? Or what? anything, really? What do you got going on that's coming uh, that you can talk about? you know about the crypt? Did you find in your writings about the crypt that I have? Yes, uh, that was one of my questions. Okay, I yeah, wanted, that's one, good. Go ahead. One of the, one of the topics I kind of wanted to cover was, if you would so kindly indulge, is your study of bioenergy and what you were hoping to achieve after you're gone. You have a crypt at Hollywood Memorial Cemetery already picked out. Um, 804, is that correct? Yeah, boy, boy you did your homework. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm famous for doing my homework when we do these. Um, it, now... I saw something where you said you hope to succeed where Harry Houdini failed mm -hmm. in reaching back across the ethereal plane after your death. So what makes you so confident in that claim and what in a perfect afterlife would you hope to actually achieve in some sort of tangible results in that realm? Mm. That's deep. Well, that's a good question. Really good question because <laughs> obviously what Harry was trying to do through his wife at seances was mm -hmm. to, you know, somebody speak like Harry, maybe he appears or whatever. And I have a lot of faith or belief that where something traumatic happens, there's residual energy that stays in there. Or even if it's going to your grandmother's house 20 years later and it's like, it's not my memory. I could just feel my grandmother still here. You know, mm -hmm. there's a whole other part of us in that sixth sense realm that, you know, we we know something like a millisecond before it happens in life, all of us. We never really think about it, but there's done studies, you know, that you sort of feel actually from the heart before it actually gets to your brain. And they've done all kinds of crazy, you know, actual scientific studies about all that stuff. And I started thinking about, well, wait a minute. What if you stayed in at one place and you put all this energy in there for the sole purpose that later people would come and see if they could feel something, hear something, whatever. So every year on my birthday for the last 10 years, I have a crypt warming, you know, a housewarming crypt warming. And okay. anybody who wants to comes at noon on July 19th. And it's just talking about our lives what's going on, what you've been doing and stuff. And, and the script just sits there, just fucking sits there. It's my modem <laughs> that developed in time. And it's soaking it in on it that uh, red, you know, I, I looked at all the things I said, nobody's done red. Nobody's made a curtain out of the sides of it. Nobody's used to die it must be an awfully big adventure, Peter Pan. And then birthday, death date still to be 
revealed. And, you know, it, then it, it has the instructions, you know, close your eyes, open your heart, I'm here. So I'm not going to come back. I'll hopefully be in heaven or wherever the hell I'm going to be. But I feel that there's a way, in the same way they tore down all these places where, like OJ, where he murdered all these because people just got freaked out. You know, I've done so much research on ghosts and stuff. It's not ghosts. It's energy. It's stuff that, you know, if you see, like we demonstrated in, in, in One Dark Night, Korean photography, you know, you can take a flower mm -hmm. and you cut it, you know, you see it with the ore around it, and then you cut it, flower is gone, but the ore still stays there for a bit, right? you know, until this thing dies, right? So if you have a traumatic event, you beat the fuck out of your wife, you know, and she's screaming and the other guy, you know, and, and stabbing people in the, the mansion, all these extreme things, there's always some sort of residual something that's left over that some of us are very sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. pick it up. Other people, I don't feel fucking nothing. I hear you me crazy, you know, okay. But there's times where it's like positive and negative energy that comes together, yin yang, whatever. It's all been proven for, for many years, but it can't be a science until you can do the same formula three times and you get the same results all three times. Now you can start talking about science. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Society for Psych Psychical Sciences in London has been around 110 years or something. And that's their whole goal is to find a way to prove this as science. I thought, maybe I'm not even around here. Maybe I can set up something that happens after I'm gone. It's like, so what do you care? What do you care? You're not even going to know about it. Right now I do. Right now I'm right. very excited. It's like making a movie. We're going to do that. Oh, and then when you're making a movie, so why the fuck did I want this? It's terrible. You know, or it comes out and nobody goes. I said, but this right now is that thing where you get the phone call and it's like, guess what you're going to get to do? So I decided I'm just going to be as positive about this approach when people come i don't want them to do anything or wave any magic just make that area feel like warm and if somebody happens to hear something i go in there sometimes and just play harmonica you know the echoes through the place if somebody happens to hear that holy shit you know we put you know how great if it's, the show goes on the show goes <laughs> on after the man's long gone and so that is sort of like trying to do something that harry didn't do because they've never felt that they got to him but i thought well they're on the rooftop of this place they're in new york here they're, they're you know what is he going to gravitate towards you know or where was the most you know traumatic area in his life you know if they always did it in his mother's house or something if that was standing things like that made more sense to me from a scientific standpoint mm -hmm. right and i've had so many people go that's crazy but it's cool you know and i go <laughs> look it's both i to me and <clears throat> my ex-wife a little bit of the reason why she was like, where am I going to be? I don't know. <laughs> that's it for me. That's, that's the modem. You know, that's where the energy is going. And if something comes out, I don't want to be cremated. You know, God forbid I'm in a fire. And it's like, where is oh. it? You know, is there any piece? But oh, no. still, all that work has already kind of been laid off, laid into that area. And hopefully there's people that want to go with that intention that we're going to see what happens. And I've seen ghosts in my past. I had a girlfriend of them in my teenage years. She always was seeing ghosts and things. She just was very open. So that sort of got me kind of going on that. There's more than news, weather, and sports out there. Um, uh -huh. And you can pull in all kinds of weird stuff if you're not careful. And people that mess with Ouija boards, it's like, yeah, it's a toy. It depends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of things with, that, that we play with that in the wrong hands and the wrong you know, energy of things. It, it's just, I just think there's a, that, that spirit realm that we don't quite understand, but it mm -hmm. can register. And we do have pictures of certain things that it's not a flare in the lens. That's something yeah. else. So, you know, I love that whole world. And I also love fairy tale, the movie about the two girls who photograph fairies that we did. Um, and that was all, you know, a, a prank, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with these two girls and they just, Use dolls and set it up, but Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said it's real. He drags some BB in. I think that's real. And he goes, No, it can't be real. It's like, I mean, but everybody wanted to believe it, and people would go there and see things, you know. So there's also that I'm kind of hoping works for me as well in this experiment. But it is an experiment post life. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I, 
and it came about because they had a party at that cemetery for my 60th and right. everybody was up talking about me and their life right i said this is i'm not going into the third act i'm sorry i'm in the second act third act i don't know when that's going to happen but there's going to be a third act and the next day when i came back to thank the guy for letting us do this at the cemetery that's when i saw the crypt and that's when it was got a crazy idea there's the third act after you know wow. you're gonna have to and wait i've never heard it oh nobody's wishing for it right but well, you know, and I, but my i i sort of set 2050. i want to get at least to there you know <laughs> it gets me to 100. not a lot right. of people make it to 100. dick van dyke's doing really great you know there's a uh, director in uh brazil that was on the set at 105 you know mm -hmm. directing and going to con and stuff and i went fuck spielberg that's my hero i want to be fucking <laughs> directing at 105. You know, it's just if you those the stuff that you love, you just want to keep doing it, and hopefully people go, he's great. He, I can't believe he's doing this. You know, and just hopefully the the, you know, the work still is good. Yeah. And, you know, you, you don't go crazy, and you don't know what the fuck you're doing. You know, well, and that's but, a, that's you know, an interesting have, way too. You know, there's got to be a brass ring out. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's an interesting way that you you're already setting it up. You know, you're you're meeting there every year on your birthday to set it up. And then after you are gone, whether it be, you know, 2040, 2050, you're hoping that people continue to go there on July 19th at noon and be a part of this, whether whether you're there or not, you know, and hopefully you are spiritually there somehow to, you know, prove Harry Houdini wrong. I, that's a fascinating. I've Ever since I saw that video a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know I saw it years ago, too, but I found it again after we had agreed that for you to come on. I was just like, holy shit, that I, I want to know about this. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, those, what is it called, Hollywood Graveyard. it has been a number mm -hmm. of shows now that go and visit and show the celebrities and stuff. And just the other day, I was flipping, there was another new one, and they were looking at Peter Lorre, who was right around the corner from me. And, you know, and then go, now here's a guy, this is a pretty famous director. And I went, oh, it's nice to hear, you know, and he's, uh, he's not in there yet, but he's got, you know, and they read all the stuff and it's like, well, this will be interesting to see what this guy's going to do here. So, wow. So, yeah. You know, I thought, all right, put it out uh, there, you know. Put it out there. me, I have a much deeper appreciation for Raymar. I can see it. One <laughs> Dark Night too, McLaughlin's Crypt. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. <laughs> why well, not? And hey, yeah. guys, in, in July, we have to go out to uh, Albuquerque. Uh, in Albuquerque. Not too far of a hop, skip, yeah. and a jump out to L.A. the rest of the oh, way if we wanted to pop out there for July 19th. It's like the following yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. See Johnny Day. Ramone and D.D. Ramone and yeah. Dave Garland's there and Mickey Rooney and wow. obviously, well, you know, Rudolph Valentino. Um, you, you wrote the initial treatment for Jason Lives there. Yeah. On notebook yeah. paper or whatever, so... That man. So you're been, you've been still running on YouTube. Um, I think it's called Legends Never Die. Legends Never Die. Yeah. Yeah. How I wrote it there. Wow. I mean, it sounds like yeah. You're under this theory and mm. everything. You are putting energy in there with all this stuff like that already. So I mean, this is fascinating. Just you know, I mean, damn if if something it's, crazy were to happen, I mean, and you find a way to break through, I mean, that's that'd be why not? You know, I mean, it would be uh, absolutely. It would be. It would be. Someone would call it a hoax. They'd be like, "This, this is all set up. This is some carnival shit, some haunted house special effects or something." Yeah. No one's gonna buy it, but uh, it is a fascinating, fascinating story. Like, now that I I've heard it. it spelled out yeah. like that, yes. <laughs> so yeah, the, on one of those shows too. There was a point where I actually put a doorbell, you know, on the on the crypt, <laughs> so people could push it. And it goes, <laughs> <laughs> and it stayed for quite a while. Very happy they didn't take that down. But eventually, either a fan took it or they took it down. Oh, but man. on one of the videos, one of those shows, they they show it. So I'm glad at least it got documented. But there was a point where I was talking to magicians about: Is there something that could be sound related that is on some sort of spring thing? So if somebody knocked on the crypt, this thing would be activated, not on electricity, that it would unwind and bump, bump, bump back on the yeah. inside that you know my son could set that up after everybody's left you know so that if somebody does that it's gonna 
back at you. But so that's remember those. I, mean, I, I, you know, I tried to give it a magic the, effect. I, I got, I got, I got to play fair. You know. <laughs> yeah, there were those little gimmick boxes that you could shake back in the uh, like eighties. I think I remember seeing them around. You could shake them, and it'd be like a little crate, and it would say like you know from China, pa- pasted on it and painted on it or whatever. But you could shake it yeah. or tap it, and it would be like, "Hey, hey, let me out of here! Let me out of here! Let me out of here!" You'd hear this little voice in there. My mom used to love those, but you maybe get some kind of rig like that that was voice activated or something in there. No. Well, I was thinking and, it's, it's got to be long term. You know, I can't run electricity in there. Batteries right. need to go out. You know, it's like you know, no, no, no uh, solar. So you know, it'd have to be on some sort of spring kind of mechanism. That, yeah. And I'm not sure how you do that, but I said, mm. I, I went. I, I don't want to be a fake magician. I want to do an illusion that's not an illusion. It actually happened. But I truly believe if anything does happen, it is going to be the receptor that has something that allows that to happen. Whether that means they're a little off, so their wiring somehow allows that part of them to actually hear something. If you've been around people who are mentally challenged in any number of ways, there's Mm -hmm. other senses that kick in that are so far advanced. You know, it's like Brain Man, you know, the fact that he could count all this stuff. It's kind of in that world that there are certain people that do pick up stuff and, you know, and they're talking about stuff or when they're talking to somebody on the street corner, there's actually somebody that they're looking at and having a definite conversation with. It's not yeah. like they're just talking. What are they seeing? You know, and how are they seeing? It? Wow. And so there's something there. We just don't understand it yet. You know, like if, yeah. I, if I held this up 20 years ago and say, look, <laughs> we can talk any place to anybody in the world. You can watch TV on here. Fuck you. What, what is it? That piece of plastic. We we're going like crazy in that world. This computer has far more advantages, um, and just has to be tapped. Some of these scientists and the psychic people gotta somehow get on the same page. Oh man! Well, I hope we're years and years and years away from having having to worry about any of this, sir. That's what I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there, it's that thing. What are the things we're scared of? Taxes <laughs> and death. And I thought, why do we have to be afraid of it? Why can't we take the line from Peter Pan and say it could be an awfully big adventure and not be afraid of it? And it's like, that's the thing that people like, you know, what if I end up in hell? You think there's a hell? I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> and some people do good deeds because they don't want to get punished. Other people do good deeds because they're good people. The other people go, I don't fucking care. You know, it, who, who was it I just read about? Uh, just died. Uh, oh, um, the comedian uh, Richard Belzer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think his last words is like "fuck you, fuck you." <laughs> that's what I told, was told. I don't know if that's true, but I thought I don't think I'd want to do that. Whatever, whatever is out there, I wouldn't want to go out unless you like love the joke of that. You know that that's kind of way I feel you know, like. Like I want to say that went back to a bit he did back in the uh, in the eighties. Uh, something about uh, when he was going to die, he was going to you know say something to you know tell the tell the spirit world fuck you, go ahead and take me or yeah. whatever. I I think it goes back to that, but it may be it may be true. It may be kind of one of those legends that lives on. He was great yeah. though. Yeah. yeah oh was. man. Wow. <sighs> That's, I love the one for George Carlin. Uh, uh, his tombstone just says. I don't know. He was here a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, as a gem. That and guy. I think Jack Lemon is this Jack Lemon, and there's an arrow pointing down. <laughs> <laughs> Those things always are wonderful. You know that you can actually be gone and you're still making people laugh. You know. Yeah. Wow, man. Um, I think that's a good place to yeah, call man. it right there. Uh, as, as much as I would love to keep going because i have shit ton more questions for you but we'll do it another time another time uh if you're willing yeah <laughs> we'll do so we'll do the bonus footage episode <laughs> uh mr mclaughlin holy yes. shit thank you very yes. much this has been very very enlightening and i, I, I hope the audience that is here still is just like blown away after the last like 15 20 minutes especially because that was fascinating and mm, I'm, 
I'm a little messed up right now. Uh, Ziggy, yeah. tell him, tell him good night. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, and, and if you've got anything that we can help get the word out or anything at all, crowdfunding, anything we can do to help support you, we're here for you, man. Anytime. And uh, thank you so much for that, yeah. for coming on. I, might, I, I might need everybody's help soon, maybe, um, which I'll let you know, because that's all part of this thing I can't talk about. Gotcha. It, it, mm -hmm. it might take, you know, the people you know, rising up. Not that I'm Trump. But anyway, nope. <laughs> oh, God. I, it, you know, they don't consider the fans important. Because to them, it's the audience today, not the people that love this shit way back when and mm. the cons and stuff that we all love and are part of. You know, it's like, how do you get butts in seats today? What is it that's going to get them in there? And that to me is what is so difficult when you go, but there's this ton of people that if they're saying on the internet and everything how great something is, you know, that it's a remake of something or whatever, you'll get both. I mean, because. Yeah. People are going back to the movies again and they and they want to see something that they wouldn't necessarily see with the experience with, with people and horror and comedies are the two things that you go you know you get pulled with the crowd you know they're, yeah. they're great i mean look what's happening right now with some of these independent movies coming out they're getting shot for 15 30 grand and you know they're they're they're, they're, they're catching that big distribution i get that but uh yeah i think it's out there man I, and if, if you know we start rallying people to do something like this. And if someone with some clout like yourself, it's a little mm -hmm. easier to get that ball rolling. So whatever we can do, we are here for you. Well, and Donald Trump would be pleased it. to uh, tremendously right. help you along, Rain. It's going to be uh, a yes. tremendous project, that I can tell you. <laughs> that I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had a chance right, to do boys, our Trump impersonation in a while. Yes, Tommy. You too, Tommy. Right, well, maybe I one of these days I'll be able to talk to you about, about rock and roll, man. I'm kind of disappointed to get a chance to talk music with you, but good night. Maybe some other time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah. Well, real quick, I got three bands now after the sloths okay. fell apart during COVID. You know, one is called Mojo 66. And literally, we're doing only songs from 1966, but not <laughs> like covers. The idea is, is that, you know, when you come to the show, we're dressed what we would have been wearing, you know, in 66 on a stage somewhere in the venue, teenage fair, whatever, except we're older <laughs> now. And, but we're still, you know, this is what's on the charts right now that we're playing. And then at a certain point, there things happen like, uh, uh, well, we're going to actually lose our drummer to fucking LBJ and the fucking Vietnam fucking war, <laughs> you know, and it's like, Hey, Hey, you know, and it's like, yeah, and I'm cool about going, you know? And so it's like, a little it's only partly staged kind of thing but also these songs from 66 you start to go through it yeah it was really one of the most incredible periods of soul coming in and the british rock and you know the american music all kinds of crazy things but what was the number one song in 1966 top of the charts battle of the green berets <laughs> so with all this great rock and roll still <laughs> that part of the country and for those people who believe so very, very strongly in the Vietnam wow. War and all that we were doing that was the biggest seller and I thought that is such a strange thing I would have never thought mm -hmm. the yeah. other band is called uh, Nightcrawler and Nightcrawler is me a 16 year old guitarist who can play like Eddie Van Halen you know a 18 year old uh, drummer who couldn't look more pop star if you wanted, and uh, a bass player who looks like we pulled him off the streets in East, East LA. I love getting into the energy of when I was a teenager, like they are, playing rock and roll and going, I'm going with you guys, wherever you go. So we'll rehearse this stuff for three hours. And I'm going, you're gonna keep up, dude. You wanna do this. You're gonna keep up. <laughs> and I've never sang metal songs. I mean, we're doing, you know, ACDC, you know, we're doing Van. Halen, we're doing I, all that kind of you know crazy stuff where I have to sing Wee! up here and try to get into wow. that head voice because before I was doing much more federal things. And then the third band that's still in formation is Horror Rocks. And Horror Rocks is all the great songs that have been in horror movies the last oh, man. I don't know, 50 years. And there's, been, there's a lot of really cool songs. So if you're a a metalhead or just love great rock. I mean, Sympathy for the Devil, you know, in the interview with yeah, the vampire. Yeah. This is all this stuff, you know, killer clowns from outer space. 
So it'd be a set that like at a convention, like the Saturday night party, they would be like, yeah, that'd you know, be perfect. Yes. Visual holes behind it. So it's really, a, you know, it's the merging of those two things, but the people that love the, the metal stuff and people that love those movies and they were introduced to that song through there. So, you know, huh. and that's the one where I want to, you know, have like guests who are at the conventions come up and be part of the band. Uh, you know, oh, uh, that's so I've cool. got a couple people now, which I, I can't mention their names, but big fucking bands that they say, hey, if I can get there, I'll definitely get on stage and jam with you guys, so, <laughs> which would be a lot of fun. That, so that's the band that was story a, up to now. That was the project I had heard about was the horror rocks thing, and, and that yeah. just that was pretty exciting sounding. And I thought the same thing at a convention setting. Yeah. That would, that would be fascinating. Or hound parties, Saturday nights. Yeah. yeah. That's Maybe. what I, you know, yeah. I performed as Michael Myers or Mike the mind at the Halloween, mm -hmm. second Halloween day, <laughs> you know, just cause I thought, you know, I can do mine still and do it as Michael Myers and did a trailer. I think it's still on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Check it. Um, I think it is, you know, of how we found out that, Mike disappeared for a long period of time and he went to Paris and now he's like a street mime. And, you know. <laughs> that actually sounds like a better storyline than Halloween ends, honestly, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah. It was fun playing Michael, you know, and, and doing these things and doing takes and stuff. Cause it, I mean, Buster Keaton, that was his whole thing was doing a very passive face. So, so many things, double takes and all that stuff, you know, really work without right. seeing the face. So that was wow. a perfect, different. Yeah, well, again, right. thank you, sir. Yes. And uh, yes. you have a great night, and we're going to oh, let you go, and then we'll sign off for the night. So All we right. appreciate it. Okay, guys. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everybody. Have wow. a good one. <sighs> wow. There he goes. Yeah, that was uh, yes. pretty, was pretty fascinating. You know, I mean, that's just it. I mean, once the stories start flowing, we're going to back the fuck up and let these guys talk. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, these icons of, of the – they been through it they they were there when all this was king and everything and it's i i love it i just yeah. love it. i had I knew, so many more things about one dark night but i just didn't want to saturate it all after reading all your questions and everything oh well and I, you saw i only got to like six yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we gotta have them back another time to do this again so. six out of the uh 26 questions i guess but oh yeah i was pretty much just letting go i was pretty much just doing like i said doing uh Fuck, I'm drawing blanks on names tonight. That rubbed off on me. Uh, doing Chris Farley. You remember when you filmed uh, Jason <laughs> Lamb? That was awesome. That was awesome, man. Just let him go. <laughs> so. uh, right. Yeah, and I am going uh, right after we get off the air, and I'm going to put the link again in the comments, but go pick up his uh, friend's book about him. Yeah. Uh, Strange Idea of Entertainment. Uh, conversations with Tom McLaughlin. Uh, Jesus Christ. I I know Colonel needed to go. I know he wanted to go. He but, stuck it out. What a trooper. Uh, I've seen him I've seen him cut the show off before when he's oh, gotten Tommy? to the point. Yeah. yeah, like that's enough. Yeah, gotta go. like, uh, I gotta go, guys. Uh, I think we're just kind of looking at each other like, is this going to end? <laughs> I saw you side eyeing him down there on the bottom yeah. row, you asshole. <laughs> yeah, uh, S. Michael says best guest ever. I know you guys could have kept talking for hours. Excellent show, DCS at its best. Um, I mean, it's been a while since we had anybody with some, you know, clout out here in a while. Right. So, yeah, and and gang, I tried to get to as many of your uh, questions that I could that seemed like, uh, especially if they were relevant and, and and timed with what we were talking about. Um, I tried to, and I apologize if I did not get to yours. Um, I'm so not it's, tough, it's, it's tough, man. You know, you got we got all the stuff we're going with, and then you know we're reading what you're saying, and you know we're all having thoughts based on what he's saying. So you right. know, that's well, and I struck a ton of questions out that I could have asked, yeah, because they've been asked a million fucking times, uh, and, yeah. And I mean, I watched all four commentary versions of Jason Lives last night. And, like, each one, you got maybe, like, one or two, like, new nuggets. Everything else was just, like, and that was it. So. And that was, um, I, like I said, I just, I knew, you know, it, it, 
everything we pretty much talked about, well, most of it had been brought up in some capacity or other, but I think we got him to no. expand on some stuff tonight, yes. you know, that he's never said before. So I, yeah. I think it's a success. I think we did okay tonight with it. We, I, I, didn't, I had not seen, and I, I wanted to get a little deeper into this, I had not seen him talk about much about his TV career anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I'd seen him mention it, but I hadn't seen him talk about it. And the fact that we were able to get him to talk about Donald Sutherland and then Brando, especially, I, I, know I you heard were for that Brando fucking. Oh, I was I was hard on for that fucking yeah. Brando story, man. <laughs> that wasn't even that wasn't even really a question about about Brando. That was just please tell me about that fucking meeting because I want to know about that fucking meeting because I've heard other stories about Brando. Um, uh, that show about The Godfather the other night, uh, or not the other night, the uh, last year. The offer on Paramount Plus had a moment where they met Brando, and everyone's freaking out. But it's played off like, and like he said, he's in a moo moo when he comes out, and yep. you meet him in his living room. And he's like, eh, eh, eh. It it, almost dead on to what the offer describes, and it's hysterical. So his impersonation was hysterical. He's gone. <laughs> oh, his Dino was even better. Dino, yeah, Dino was great. Dino yeah. was so good. Which um, one of you guys wouldn't take a blowjob from Monica Lewinsky? <laughs> yeah. The fuck, man. That's that was funny. Um, I wanted to throw. I saw uh, Gory Tiger was out there. I wanted to work in there, like you know, what his opinion was on whether he thinks that you know Adam Marcus says Jason's a deadite because uh, that's what Gory Tiger was asking. So. I, I, saw, it I, I saw that, but I couldn't get into I, it. I didn't want to break the rhythm we were on. You know what I mean? Right. We couldn't do it. Um, Tarek says, exactly. Tommy had things to talk about that he clearly wanted to talk about, and that was a lot of fun to watch. I, I think a lot of that is like a defense mechanism from him being on other shows and yeah. some of those shows not exactly knowing what they wanted to do, so he just kind of takes over. Kind of a lot, a lot the same way Adam Marcus does. Adam Marcus has done a ton of these, and he's yeah. probably he been bored out of his mind in some of them. But I mean, and I he's think, just taking it over. I think they come over here, and they expect that from us, and then they get, oh, these guys actually did some reading before having us on. All right, good, yeah. good. Let's let's do it then. And, and it shows. I mean, I think they, they open up. They open up more if we're doing it right. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, She's well, we're only fifty four minutes past uh, the showtime end, but uh, thanks, you know. Yeah, thanks Woo. for sticking around with us, gang. Next week we're covering Cocaine Bear. Uh, should be an interesting, interesting yeah. review. Uh, I think Colonel is the big play started. Great <laughs> <you> go. <laughs> he just take a vial, <laughs> vial of cocaine. So, so no, I, I I was reading. This is based. It's loosely based on a true story. So, I mean, yeah. but. Well, and it was written by, I saw today, it was written by uh, Samara Weaving's husband. So, okay. I, didn't, I didn't realize that. But Seth is here. Hey, guys, hope all is well. Missed your interview live, but looking forward to checking it out tomorrow. Yep, it's uh, almost three hours long. But yeah. uh, thanks, man. You know, yeah. it, you, it, we it was just, cool, though. We're going to ask Cushion, because trust yeah. me, I could have used one tonight. It was cool. It was definitely cool, brother. And it uh, was long, but it was. I think it was worth it. it was good. We got some stuff out of him. I think we got some stuff that you might not yeah. have heard before. So I. Oh yeah. Patting crank on the back. I'm patting me on the back, and I'm patting a colonel on the back. Damn it. Woo! All right. One last time, I want to thank our members. Thanks to our final girls and guys: Chris, Lorena, Christy, Patricia, Tanya, and Tyrone, and of course our crazy Ralph Raymond and our camp counselors: S. Michael, Stacy, Lynn, Orlando, Kiara, and Dave. <sighs> I know. Paying attention. I it's knew it as much as I could. It's well, fucking Miller time. And I had the uh, sounded like the ambulance going over to pick somebody up across the street that showed up. Yes, like right there <laughs> near the end. And but it was funny because it was right around the time he's talking about like the the crypt shit. And I'm yeah. like, oh shit, somebody just died over there. Maybe I should go hang out and talk to them. So, reenactment of daylight savings time. <laughs> Actually, 10 p.m. <laughs> I left my alarm, Terry, because God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> but, man, All right. Uh, yeah. It. Let's do it. I'll start it. Boy, there send, you go. Send them. Yeah, send them. I, I hopefully, this lived up to the 
five months or five weeks of hype that we put into it, but uh, I would do Fuck it. You. I would do it again. I would do it absolutely. Do it again. Uh, we'll get any heavyweight we can like that. Any poor royalty, we'll bring them right to you. Any single time we can. We're working on it. We've got others in the hopper coming your way soon. Don't uh-huh. go anywhere. Big announcements coming. Hopefully, hopefully the next couple of weeks here we got some shit to share. That's mm-hmm. official. It's not official yet, so we can't not do it. Yeah. One's official, but the other one's official. official. One is way cooler, though. You're gonna <laughs> dig it. You guys might actually want to uh, look into some travel arrangements for one of these. That's what I'm saying. There's a tease. <laughs> Thanks for coming, though. We love you guys, and uh, like I said, cocaine bear next week. Let's get high and uh, you know talk about bears on coke, Colonel. Speaking of bears on coke, speaking of bears. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun tonight. You know, I'm, I'm with you guys. I enjoy this. Every once in a while, it's a little I stand up an hour past my fucking bedtime. <laughs> this will be one of those few times. So I'm just going to make it really quick. Don't get sick. Wash your dick. Don't smoke Scuba Steve. Use Summer's Eve. Fun mm-hmm. with wisdom. I feel good. I love the feeling after one of these shows like this. I feel oh, so dude. good, man. Even though I'm only running on like two hours of sleep, I'm going to be like... <laughs> for yeah. Hours, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a few hours before I'll be able to lay down, but you know, yeah. that's what marijuana is for. <laughs> like they said, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. It's been... This has been one of the funnest nights I think we've uh, had doing this mm-hmm. uh, in a long time. So Definitely good. <sighs> Thank you all very much. We will see you next week for Cocaine Bears Review. And until then, uh, yeah. Woo! Have a good night, folks.